We are living in a critical moment in history where our global society is confronted with seemingly insurmountable challenges. And at the center of all these challenges is the issue of democracy. The idea of allowing the people to choose their leaders and the policies under which they live by the simple mechanism of having a vote was a revolutionary idea in the history of Western thought. Decentralizing power by distributing it into the hands of the people has undoubtedly led to the improvement in the quality of life for many around the world. As Western society has progressed and technology has advanced, we have seen a trend towards more decentralized and democratic forms of governance. But this hasn't been an easy road. There have been numerous obstructions and setbacks, and today, democracy faces its greatest obstacles yet. While the advancements of technology seem to be the rising tide lifting all boats, many have gotten stuck in polluted and murky waters. Developments in communication technologies, which once seemed to herald a new golden age of democracy and free information, have instead only seemed to foment more political division and tribalism, leaving us in permanent gridlock fighting bureaucratic wars of attrition and rendering us unable to address the problems of global warming, wealth inequality, and the global pandemic. The systems we use to run democracy have become outdated in today's rapidly changing environment. Our governance systems will always lack the information they need to govern if we only participate by sending them a few checkboxes every two years. And we just can't participate meaningfully if our information is filtered through the channels managed for the power and profit of shareholders. Because of this, autocratic regimes around the world have become emboldened to expand their power as they diminish the rights of their people. And global corporations continuously overstep their boundaries by exploiting our data, forcing us to become increasingly dependent on their services and platforms, plunging us into a sort of new kind of techno-feudalism. But democracy, when richly understood, is more than just voting. It's a system of involving people in self-governance, arriving at shared goals which may not be perfect, but that at least respect plurality. Fortunately, there are innovators who are working right now, both inside and outside of governments and corporations, to address these issues, developing radical social technologies tools and systems that help us not to achieve individual goals or even pursue fixed collective goals, but tools that help us form shared goals. These radical social technologies include such tools as quadratic voting, which can help relieve the pressure of gridlock and break the fever of division inflaming our current political discourse. Also, structures such as DAOs and user-owned co-ops which allow the users and content creators to have a say in how the platforms they use actually work. Today, you will hear from Anasuya Sengupta as she discusses the lack of representation of marginalized communities on the internet and ways that we can address these issues. Sushant Kumar talks to Tim O'Reilly, Paul Romer, and Matt Pruitt about the data economy and ways that we can improve it by allowing users to have more control over how their data is used. Fred Turner and Charlotte Kent will discuss how the arts can more effectively communicate democratic ideals and ideas to the general public. And you will also learn about how groups like Culture Stake, Gitcoin, Ampled, and Radical Exchange itself are developing and utilizing radical social technologies to help create a more democratic future. This is Radical Exchange, a new era of democracy. Hey everyone, welcome to the 2021 Radical Exchange conference from myself, Glenn Weil, and my daughter, Talia Audrey Weil. We're really excited to be welcoming you all to this conference. For Talia, more than for me, we desperately need a new era of democracy. Today, more than ever, 
The forces shaping all of our lives are at scales that don't match with the usual ways we governed ourselves. We have climate change ravaging our world at a global scale. We have rivers being depleted across many countries. We've got networks of software and production that snake their way around the world. We don't have the capacity to govern those things democratically because our institutions aren't shaped to meet the demands of the problems that we face. What Radical Exchange is really trying to do is to build tools that make possible all the richness of the democratic interactions we'd have in a town hall or a club open to us at those scales in that flexible way. So that when Talia grows up, she will live in a world that's much more democratic than the world that we know, not one where democracy is receding behind the forces of global commerce and bureaucratic organization. I think that Taiwan has been an incredible inspiration to people around the world, but there is a natural human tendency to distrust examples that seem too socially distant. There's an inclination to think that everyone in Asia is just naturally cooperative and they're all friendly and nothing like that could ever work in the fractious politics of the United States. I think that's mistaken, but I think that we have to bring that experience, that richness from that distant point to something that's more accessible. And I think Colorado is just a critical beachhead in that. It's a state with deep roots for both conservatives and for liberals. It's a tremendous opportunity for us to show people, whether it's in the private sector and the things that Gitcoin is doing, or in the public sector and the things we're doing with the Polis administration and with the Democrats in the state houses, that these are not things for people over there, that Colorado can become a laboratory of democracy open to the world with its eyes looking around for new examples to bring home. I'm Nathan Schneider. I'm a professor of media studies at the University of Colorado Boulder. I run a lab called the Media Enterprise Design Lab, where we're exploring the futures of online governance, along with also a collaboration called the Meta Governance Project, developing new tools and doing research and exploring the experiments already underway, recognizing that the tools that we have before us could be used to develop more creative, more appropriate and powerful forms of democracy. Well, I think the local and the global are really connected, actually. The failures of democracy at the largest scales today around, you know, the slide in many countries toward authoritarianism and toward the darker sides of populism are actually connected to the fact that in our online lives, which is fueling a lot of these patterns, we don't experience democracy in our daily lives. You know, We don't experience that in the way software structures our interactions with each other. We don't get to vote out our bad moderator of a subreddit. We don't get to build civic organizations that we can co-govern. And that might seem like a small thing, like who cares how you choose your subreddit, but I don't think we can say that anymore at a time where we know that these platforms are driving some of these tendencies. We know that they're driving the polarization and the decline in trust in institutions. And I think that actually some of those micro patterns, those, those intimate experiences we have of social life online are having really powerful consequences. And if you don't 
don't believe me, you can just go back to Alexis de Tocqueville's account of what he saw in the early years of democracy in the United States. And what he identified was this connection that others have seen over and over between our daily civic life, the practice of, of democracy every day, and our ability to participate as citizens in a, in a much larger democratic society. I've seen this in my work for years in trying to organize folks who are building cooperative businesses. So these are people, you know, like obsessed with practicing democracy in their in their everyday lives. And yet in our online interactions, I kept noticing, wow, these tools are really terrible for doing like the basic things we need to do in cooperative governance, at least to do it online. Everything is designed around, you know, a kind of permissions control system where the root owner has all this power and assigns power to whoever they want and then can take it away whenever they want. And even like the premises of our recent kind of debates about deplatforming point to the sense in which unelected people have tremendous power over who gets uh, a voice in, in our society, not even a, unelected, but not even appointed by someone who is elected, like a, those much maligned bureaucrats. The more you look at it, the more you realize a lot of the unhealthy stuff that we see in online life comes from people's lack of feeling uh, that there is accountability. One thing I've been observing a lot lately is in the debates about cancel culture. It's a context where there's a lot of blame heaped on people who are kind of righteously indignant about, about somebody doing something that offends them, right? But what other option do people have? And I, I, I've seen this from kind of the inside, from you know, being part of communities where uh, call-outs have occurred. And what you notice is that actually people don't have another choice. They don't have processes that they can go to to adjudicate conflicts. If you have a conflict with your admin, you know, or a kind of big social media person, you know, there's no other way than this kind of crass mass horde of pitchforks to deal with the conflict. And that, again, is a sign of the poverty of the tooling for community governance. We have all these wondrous technologies, so we assume that the problem must be us. I would argue that you know a lot of the problems are actually in the design of our technologies and the kinds of skills that then human beings using them are able to cultivate and develop and evolve together. One of the most exciting kind of developments underway right now is explorations in restorative and transformative justice, particularly among people who have been involved in Black Lives Matter or are looking for alternatives to coercive, violent policing and incarceration. And there's so much creativity happening around the world and conversations and information sharing. And it's been very powerful to explore that stuff. At the same time, the more I've explored it, the more I've come to the recognition that our online spaces are headed in the opposite direction. At a moment when what we need is like more attention to people engaged in conflict and uh, more options available to them, the companies running our online platforms by and large are seeking to simplify every interaction and every act of moderation. They're trying to enable themselves to automate as much of the, the conflict space as possible. When in fact, what we might need as human beings more is the opposite. And, you know, it's unfortunate because these companies are compelled by their business models, their, their ownership structures to scale exponentially, to be able to increase the number of users without really increasing their costs. Whereas, Anybody who's interacted with the legal system, you know, our flawed, broken, horrible legal system is that, you know, what we really need is to make sure we have resources to address every conflict on its own terms, to hear out the facts in every case, to make sure that all sides are supported and that we're able to also see the underlying community harms. Uh, that are causing these kinds of conflicts. And that stuff doesn't have to be as expensive as our kind of deeply flawed legal system. But, you know, even that deeply flawed legal system recognizes you do need a courthouse in every town. You know, you can't expect exponential growth, exponential scale. You need to be prepared to meet each conflict where it is. And that's something that, again, our, our models of growth and development in online spaces have not been equipped for. And, you know, as a result, many people in 
the restorative and transformative justice community say, we could never bring this stuff online. The question I keep asking is, what would it take for us to be able to bring those processes online? What different kinds of approaches to our online spaces would we need for them to actually be really welcoming and inviting and, and actually empowering for these kinds of transformative processes? That to me is, you know, is a question we're not asking, you know, really because of the business models. Businesses are trying to capitalize on people's desire for community, right? Things like Discord, they're not real servers, but they call them servers to give you the experience that you're running your own community space, even though it's on the company's cloud. I'm, for instance, part of a social media uh, co-op that does actually run its own servers. It's called social.coop, and we run a kind of Twitter-like instance of Mastodon. And it's a few hundred people, and it's it's nice as a few hundred people. You can also interact with people outside of that network. It's a good group of people who I enjoy hanging out with. And it's it's that, that human-scaled experience that we miss out on and that is also really important for building those democratic skills, those habits, rituals, norms, all the stuff that you don't see written in a constitution but makes democracy happen. Um, those things need to be cultivated. They need to be exercised every day. And, and human-scaled spaces allow us to do that. I imagine a context in which democracy is always evolving. I mean, so much of the discourse about democracy now is we have to protect it, right? There are all these authoritarians and, you know, these populist parties and whatever, and we have to protect 18th century institutions. And uh, I think that is a losing game. I would love to see is what I already get to see in certain subcultures that I like to, that I've been following and, and kind of lurking among in the last few years. You know, I mentioned the restorative and transformative justice communities, people looking for alternatives to police violence, as well as, you know, the crypto communities and the, and some of the DAOs, where it's like you, you pop in there every week and there's a new voting system that somebody's trying out. And um, you just can't keep up with the amount of creativity that people are, are exercising in order to figure out how to build systems that actually do the things they want to do. And it's that kind of dynamism that will enable democracy to survive. When we stop fixating on things that seemed appropriate a couple hundred years ago, and you know, we learn lessons from those, and we just keep evolving and trying out new things and trying to build structures of accountability that really do work for us. The philosopher Jacques Derrida talked about democracy as democracy to come. He refused to detach the word from that, you know, avenir, that sense that we don't have it yet uh, and we won't have it. To practice democracy is always to anticipate its eventual coming. It's this kind of messianic faith that has to remain, you know, always aspirational or it dies. Part of democracy is play. It's a really important part of it. And you see that in elections. It kind of drives us crazy sometimes, you know, how much they start to look like a football game. Everybody's cheering for their side. But I think that's actually just a reflection of the fact that, you know, democracy is a kind of play, just like football is a kind of play. And we need to, to allow ourselves to play more fully in that. Maybe not always with that kind of partisan competitiveness, right? Maybe the play takes other forms. Maybe it takes cooperative forms. Maybe it it's solo play sometimes. Maybe it's, you know, it, it has to happen on all sorts of levels. But one way or another, if democracy doesn't feel like play, you know, nobody's going to want to do it because it's a lot of work. There's always a, a, the meme channel where people are just throwing in incredible amounts of you know, absurdity. An example like the way in which Gitcoin has been using this greatest LARP game this game around the mythology of Moloch and, and the, the dream of slaying Moloch, the god of coordination failure. All that is an effort to say, let's play together. They launched this right at the moment where they're launching their token and trying to get people into the governance game with them. And I think it's a great example of a team that really understands that if they're successful, people are going to have fun helping to build the project together and that they want to create those kinds of that kind of rush, that kind of experience of shared 
purpose and play. If their very financially oriented organization is going to get anywhere, if those financial incentives are going to work, you know, you also have to have that deep sense of, you know, human fun involved. If you consider the rural electric agricultural co-ops in the United States, still at the annual meetings of rural electric co-ops in Colorado here, we have a robot who shows up. The food is amazing and it's a big party. But also they have a summer camp, right, where kids go and in the process of doing all sorts of fun outdoor stuff, they learn how to build a co-op. 4-H clubs. These clubs all about like fun and learning agricultural skills were part of that co-op tradition as well, recognizing you need to meet the human being at all levels. You know, you, you have to create this container that allows us to be our full selves. And when you see a vibrant site of democratic innovation, you always see that, you know, you see people laughing their asses off because that's why they're there. And then, you know, the, the creativity just flows from that play. Yeah, Colorado has been a really fun place to work on a lot of these things. One aspect of that is that we have some of the most flexible cooperative laws in the country. And that was the result of our of our agricultural co-ops looking for more options. Colorado is a is a pragmatic place. This is kind of deep in the culture here. You know, so are different forms of cooperation and and as a result, there's a lot less respect for, you know, the way it's always been done and a lot more interest in, okay, what what do we need to get something done today? And the the co-op laws have made it so that we have co-ops from all over the country actually incorporating here using our flexible statutes and doing some really, really interesting things as a result. And part of that is starting to bring some DAOs into cooperative statutes. So, you know, for instance, we have a conference here in February called ETH Denver, and it is structured as a cooperative as well as a DAO. And that emerging opportunity is, I think, a chance to blend some of the you know, economic dynamics in DAOs with the kind of democratic logic of cooperatives. But, you know, when you talk to the, you know, the folks, for instance, in the in the Democratic caucus uh, who started adopting quadratic voting or, for instance, Kevin Iwaki at Gitcoin, who was also based in Colorado and brought quadratic voting into that system. You know, it's just like a, a willingness to try stuff, enthusiasm for possibilities. We just have a few pieces of you know, of cool infrastructure that have enabled people to build uh, in ways that, you know, that others haven't. You know, one thing, too, is our governor currently, uh, Jared Polis, has initiated uh, at the state level a commission to advance employee ownership in the state. That's the only state level commission currently running in the country. There are some smaller processes, but um, this is the state level one. And it's enabled us to start developing revolving loan funds and to really just get the word out about employee ownership models. And it you know, just made the state open to possibilities that, that people might not have thought of and that invite cooperative and democratic control you know, at every level of, of society. I mean, it was just so powerful. You know, for someone who's been working in the cooperative world for a while, like to see Polis start his campaign for governor at an employee-owned grocery store. It was a signal that this is a, a place where we recognize the value of, of shared ownership and, and economic democracy. And, and Polis came that, by that, you know, not so much through any kind of intellectual or abstract conclusion, but by being a business owner and seeing in his own experience that, you know, when you co-own the business with your employees, you know, you have a, a deeper kind of buy-in. You know, one of the most important experiences when I was writing my book about cooperatives was I went down to my aunt's place in, in Denver and um, she helped me dig up the bylaws of my grandfather's company that he ran at the end of his career. And he grew up as a farmer in Colorado and, you know, no electricity until the co-ops came. You know, this company was a, a hardware distribution co-op that he ran, a national distributor. And come into co-ops through covering Occupy Wall Street, you know, like I came into it through the kind of scrappy radicals who are trying to, you know, blow up the system and, and, and so forth. Then to come and kind of meet that full circle and recognize that my quite conservative farmer grandfather was also 
a part of that movement. I think that's part of the power of, of the kind of purplish nature of the state, you know, the, the way in which we have to recognize the stuff that we can do together and somehow figure out how we can get away from this kind of total you know, lockjam of partisan divide. And, you know, I think the search for new mechanisms are part of that. You can't engineer problems like this out of society. Um, the engineering can help. Um, it can be part of that process. But, you know, we also need, with that engineering, build the culture um, in which we can recognize that we might have different ways of talking about this stuff, but, you know, we can still do it together. Just that I'm I'm really looking forward to uh, to Radical Exchange and it, you know, Radical Exchange is a community that's really been influencing me uh, since it got going. You know, I attended the first meeting in, in Detroit and it really helped set me on the path of the work that I've been doing ever since, focused on uh, online governance. And, and so I'm really grateful for the, the mix of, of people and perspectives that this community has brought together. mission is to build and fund the open internet. And we do that by empowering digital creatives to earn a living building it. At Gitcoin, we are a collection of digital creatives ourselves, and we have a deep reverence for our communities of practice. We became frustrated because open source technologies that make up the open internet are severely underfunded. Yet, they enable over $500 billion in economic output per year. But more importantly, they help humanity solve some of our most pressing coordination problems. To us, these technologies are digital public goods. We all use them, and they are extremely important, but no one is incentivized to build and maintain them. We built Gitcoin to solve this issue by getting digital creatives paid to work on open source projects, and by creating opportunities for learning and connecting with like-minded peers, teaming up on projects together. We are building an entire ecosystem around supporting digital public goods, but in order to do that in a mission-driven way, we have to decentralize Gitcoin itself. That's why we're launching GTC, to evolve Gitcoin into a community-governed DAO. GTC is the governance token of the Gitcoin network, and it can be used for things like managing the treasury, settling disputes, and creating policy. And in Gitcoin grants, the community will use GTC to ratify grants rounds, surface curated collections, and help mitigate civil attacks on the quadratic funding mechanism. GTC puts the future of Gitcoin's community in your hands, so you can help direct and support digital public goods. Join us to build a world where open source technologies are funded in a democratic way, a world we call quadratic lands a better, freer world for digital creatives everywhere. Together, we'll take the journey to quadratic lands. Get started today at quadraticlands.com. Hello and welcome. My name is Charlotte Kent. I'm an assistant professor of visual culture at Montclair State University and an arts writer. And I'm joined today by Fred Turner, the Harry and Norman Chandler Professor of Communications at Stanford University. 
He is the author of several books, including the well-known From Counterculture to Cyberculture, Stuart Brand, The Whole Earth Network, and The Rise of Digital Utopianism. Today, one of the things we'll be talking about is a latest book done with Mary Beth Meehan, Seeing Silicon Valley. Our conversation is going to be exploring how the arts can communicate in ways that differ from verbal language, and why in some instances that may be a more effective tactic to communicate democratic ideals and ideas. Thank you, Fred, for joining us. Hi, Charlotte. Really nice to be here. <laughs> nice to meet you. Um, so I guess let's just get started. What led you to invite Mary Beth Meehan to San Francisco and to look at Silicon Valley? Sure. So, you know, I've, I've been living here in Silicon Valley for about 20 years. I live about two miles from Google. And, you know, a lot of my academic work focuses on Silicon Valley mythology and the sort of stories of fantastic technologies that are going to connect the world through invisible systems. And we're going to send data through the ether. And it's sort of magical. It renders the valley itself invisible. People talk about Silicon Valley as if it were a sort of magical place, a city on a hill for our time. And I know from living here that it's a complicated place, radically unequal, deeply polluted, and at the same time, quite beautiful and strange. And so I wanted to figure out a way for folks who don't live here, don't come here, to see the places it actually is, in part because to the extent that Silicon Valley really is already kind of a forerunner of what America as a whole might become, we might want to be thinking about what we actually are here in Silicon Valley and not just the stories of, you know, middle-aged men and their rockets. <laughs> So when you invited this photographer into the space, you knew that you wanted her to be there for the extended period of time that she usually does these kinds of projects. And did you have you know, suggestions, recommendations? Was this a part of a research project that you were trying to cultivate? Or was it really that you wanted her to show you her research? How was, what was the relationship like? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I really wanted her to show me her work. You know, the project started out with a sort of imagination of a book of many different photographers working to capture different aspects of the valley. I had a leftover piece of a grant that I wanted to use for that purpose. And it became clear as I started working with different photographers that, you know, many hands make messy soup. So with, with the help of a good friend, Elodie Millet, I was able to meet Mary Beth and we got along great. And, and her work really seemed to capture the human side of the communities that she works in. She'd done work at that point in Brockton, Massachusetts, an industrial town that's gone post-industrial. She'd also done the work in Noonan, Georgia, for which she's more recently become well-known. And it just seemed like a really good fit. So I was able to get another grant from Stanford to bring her out, make her a visiting artist. She was here for six weeks on the first go and then came back again for a second round. And, you know, it was entirely collaborative. Uh, you know, I see things in the Valley in the light of the research that I've done because I live here. But I've also stopped seeing certain things that she can see because she comes from far away, and particularly because she comes from industrial New England. You know, she's the grandchildren, grandchild of Italian shoemakers who worked in Brockton, Mass. in an industrial era and built a life there. And she sees class in a way that a New Englander would that, you know, mythology of Silicon Valley tells us is no longer relevant. But of course, it's all over the place. And that's one of the things that she taught me to see.
So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that, because, of course, so much of your work, as you say, has been about sort of unpacking these mythologies. But we, th we think of myths as stories, as tales, as these verbal renderings, right, that get passed from one person to the next. So when she introduced her visual way of seeing, right, how did you start to frame things for yourself differently when you transferred from thinking of it in terms of words? It's a great question. And, you know, Mary Beth and I, um, I mean, at this point, she jokes that we feel like an old married couple. And it's true. <laughs> you know, I, I don't generally collaborate. I tend to work alone. But but we worked really closely together. So we would have a dinner while she was out here. We had dinner every week, Wednesday nights, met often most days, actually, and just talked about what she was doing and what she was seeing. The thing about Mary Beth's image making is that the image itself is the product of a relationship that she builds with the person in the picture. So they have a kind of warmth and a kind of formality. They're fairly formal portraits. The power that they contain is a reflection of the relationship that she's built with that person. And what was most important to me was making visible the kind of humanity, the, the embodiedness, the relatability of the actual people who live here and distinguishing them precisely from characters in mythology. The way Silicon Valley mythology works, it's there are stories of the kinds of people who are good, the kinds of people who are bad, the kinds of people we should pay attention to, the kinds of people we shouldn't see. And then there's a kind of, um, I don't know how to, explain, how to explain it, it's almost like a visual grammar that goes along with that. And the visual grammar says that men who look a particular way at a particular age, it's from their heads that genius springs and, and these devices grow, right? And so by photographing and making visible in a warm, connected, emotionally present way, other kinds of people, um, I think I wanted to undercut the stories of the Valley that I've, I've been told and was still being told in the press. I do want to say that, you know, this book, when we did the book, no American publisher would touch it at first, which was fascinating. We had to publish it in France. In 2018, we published an earlier version of the book in France because American publishers said two things. They said, photo books don't sell, but that's not really the point because the real thing is that's not Silicon Valley. It was fascinating. They literally said over and over again, that's not Silicon Valley because we were trying to depict people at all social levels. But also one of the things, I mean, to that point, I think it is an incredibly varied scope. And I think there can be a misunderstanding given some of the tensions around Silicon Valley, which obviously we'll wind up talking about, to think that, oh, this must be a project that's going to show us all the people that never get seen right? The, the hidden side that artists have talked about. But one of the things that was really remarkable to me was the way in which, for example, there's the photograph of G and Virginia in their home, right? And, you know, each photograph includes a sort of short synopsis about the people. You discover in looking at this image that these are people who have good jobs, 
they are making by most standards, you know, a st solid upper middle class earnings, they can't afford furniture for their home, which they have bought, because the cost of things in Silicon Valley offsets these rather impressive otherwise um, salaries that they're making. So yes, there's a side of it that's Mark, who is someone whose mother was working with the material and so had a child with you know, some serious birth defects and you know, has struggled with you know, the way he can move through this world. But there's also this side of these people that you think of as being, oh, the people who attend galas and who donate money to good causes, right? And so it really is a spectrum. And I was very surprised by that, right? Because there is typically this dichotomy that we want to present. There's the good Silicon Valley that is, you know, these powerful figures that you're talking about. There's the bad Silicon Valley where those powerful figures are hiding people. And in this interesting way, she doesn't quite allow that to settle. And I'm just wondering, was that something that the two of you discussed in this process? Or was that something that her process started to show you? No, we, we talked about this from the get-go. It was one of the reasons I was drawn to her work and, and I think she to mine. Both of us are from a, a generation of kind of New England documentary work um, that we, we tend to think of as the Double Take generation. You may remember the magazine Double Take, Robert Cole's magazine. Yeah. Both of us, she's actually published in Double Take and I was just a big fan back in the day. And that's kind of our mindset going in. We wanted to make the spectrum visible. We thought that was actually what was really, really important.
it's interesting that you bring up this kind of documentary practice and that you're sort of positioning your own scholarship in that context, because again, documentary has started to get overlaid with these kinds of like unearthing the dark side. And what is it that you started to notice was her, really her practice of thinking, right? Because making art is a thinking practice. And that's part of the thing that people often forget because they get this object at the end and it becomes this very sort of objectified doing as opposed to thinking. And so I'm just wondering, you know, as someone who also sees yourself as a documentarian, but observing her going through her, what was the thinking that started to get revealed to you that is a part of the making? Yeah, that, that's a, such, such a good question. To take, take your point is that the, um, the idea of revealing the hidden um, is, I think, a trope that infects a lot of mass media. You know, I used to be a journalist. I was a journalist for 10 years. And I know that we were always supposed to go in and discover, uncover the hidden truth. I mean, that is, that is the essence of tabloid journalism. And it is what people wanted from us originally. They, they wanted either pictures of elites or people in trailers. They didn't want to know the middle. And where Mary Beth's way of thinking about documentary work and where the, where the, the sort of double take tradition comes in is that you take each person and each situation in their own right as you find them and you bring your whole self to it. Mary Beth is very preoccupied with not reproducing colonial photographic technique. She's very careful and thoughtful about not uh, you know, being a soul stealer in a way. And I think sometimes that makes the work very formal um, in a way that folks who work in other traditions don't fully understand. They sort of want that gritty street side uncovering, right? Is there a way that after the arts thinking, you know, that we've been talking about that you can help us distinguish a little bit between how we think through art and how we think through maybe in particular consumer media? Yeah. Well, so, so when we think about a medium, we, we can think across the artistic and the commercial spheres. It, it, and, you know, sometimes artists use commercial techniques and commercial technologies. But when we enter the media, and especially the commercial media, the incentives to structure vision and to structure sound and to structure the user's experience in a particular way really changes. You know, an artistic incentive might be to engender a kind of curiosity, to open one's mind toward one thing or another, to, re to reorient one's attention in a new way. So, you know, when we think about the arts, we certainly think about a medium and, and people do work in media of various kinds. And some art artists, you know, share media with commercial venues. So video art, computer art, um, but an artistic enterprise and, and a commercial media enterprise are very different. The industrial incentives behind commercial media making transform the product. And they may promise a kind of transformational experience for the audience member, for the listener, for the viewer, but they really are providing a kind of entertainment that enhances one's attraction to and presence for advertising. And that's a very particular thing. If it's a state-sponsored uh, media outlet, as it might be in another country, in that case, you're trying to orient the viewer's attention toward the mission of the state. Artistic visions, I think, are, are, are much more varied, much more different, and much more open. I think because one of the things that happened is early artists using computer technologies um, were sort of beta testers for, you know, figuring out how these were going to work and how they would be broached to the public. There, there's this kind of lingering attitude towards some artists who use technology that they've been co-opted or that there isn't a critique. I'm sort of curious why it is that despite the fact that now there's this plethora of artists who do critique technology even as they use it, there's this lingering responsibility for the technology that's assumed onto artists and the arts. That's a good question. I, I don't know the answer. You know, a lot of my work has been focused on early uptake of computational logics in the arts of the late 50s, early 60s, late 60s. In those worlds, what I saw was artists adopting computational techniques in part to claim legitimacy in high tech worlds. And I think one of the, one of the ancient roles for the arts as economies change is to provide visual and cultural legitimation for new economic forces, new economic forms, new economic powers. And so as computers come on the scene as engines of economic change and as engines of authority, everyone from John Cage to, um, oh, I don't know, Frank Stella hops on board with a kind of computational logic. A lot of early performance art from around 1970, 71, 72 really tries to bring to life a vision of a computational world and it's very playful and open. I also think that particularly since the early 80s, different parts of the art world have adopted a, a really fascinating and 
strategically ambiguous stance towards the media. Now, I mean the commercial media, where on the one hand, they can critique it and at, so, at the very same time, deploy its techniques in ways that make them valuable and visible to the commercial world. I'm thinking now of people like Barbara Kruger or Cindy Sherman, you know, that's the 80s, but, but that kind of technique is still available. And I think it's a challenge for artists. You, you have to simultaneously have a vision of your own that is somewhat outside the mainstream, but you also have to make a living. And you have to make a living in a world where, you know, everyone is using media one way or another. It seems as if technologies shifted from this sort of early moment where artists adopting them was really a way of bringing them into sort of the centered space, right? And a more welcomed space from being these, you know, high research corporate institutions to now, because they're so, you know, so prolific and so much a part of our everyday lives, they are, they are home, right? I think about the fact that so, I mean, so many tech companies are bigger than nation states, right? That they are not only economically more powerful, but they have affective power. People feel strongly about Macs versus PCs or different you know, messaging softwares or whether they're gonna use this browser or that browser. Like these are strong opinions that people have that they will fight over in a way that they rarely do around politics anymore. And it seems as if that fervor that people bring to technology has been shifted away from the larger sort of social and political discourse. I'm wondering if that's something that can even change or if we we have to do is reconsider what we mean by the social and political, because certainly it seems sometimes like the technology companies want us to think that they are the one and only realm for social and pol political life. I have a different read on this. Um, so, so you know, I, I did a book um, about the 1950s and about multimedia environments that were built in the 50s and 60s with the, the explicit aim of making the people who entered them more democratic people. And they were meant to make people expressive individuals who could express their individuality together in the face of photographs, paintings, things hung on the wall. Today, I think we inhabit a world where the cultural incentives for self-expression and the commercial incentives for harnessing, mapping, and reselling individual expression have become united. So it's a kind of a mode of control. So the old oppositions between kind of industrial and private, between artistic and commercial, are ceasing to apply. What, what's intriguing to me is, is not the allegiance that people have for particular technologies or systems, so much as it is the ways that those systems channel individual creativity and expressiveness into genre terms that are set by commercial enterprises. So TikTok, I love TikTok. I think TikTok is an absolute riot. And you know, people do politics on TikTok, they do dance on TikTok. But what intrigues me, right, particularly when young people take up TikTok, is that they, they do dances in specific sort of generically recognizable forms. And if you do a dance that doesn't fit the genre or is too far outside of it, no one watches your video. And it reminds me a little bit of say 19th century sketching. You know, when every, every, every young person at home would be sketching and they would all be sketching landscapes because landscapes are what you do. And, you know, they wouldn't have known that everyone, not everyone was doing, you know, everyone else is doing landscapes, but landscapes are what you do. And I think that that sense that these systems are providing that this is what one does, that's where the, the new kind of commercial impetus is coming in. I also repeat that I think there's a tremendous challenge for artists. How do you distinguish yourself and claim that what you are doing is in this special semi-sacred category called art when everybody's doing it? Mm -hmm. Well, I think this really brings us to the conversation around, you know, media, I mean, media and mediation, right? It's one of the challenges with screens that I think I've seen, you know, particularly expressed in the last year and a half is that because everything was on a screen all of a sudden, it was very difficult for people to distinguish different types of screen experiences. That had been true before, but because people weren't so embedded in the screen, they didn't, they weren't maybe quite as aware of it. But all of a sudden now, this one square, right, or rectangle, is the space in which you operate and you engage and you relate in so many different ways. And so it's really, I think, in, introduces variety. But what we, have, we haven't caught up with it yet. 
right? Like we, we might interact differently across the different screens or browsers or platforms because they're designed to make us do so, but we haven't adapted yet to the sense that I can bring emotional choice or psychological preference or design myself in different ways to different spaces, the way we feel very comfortable doing it from one room to the next. I think that's exactly right. And my analogy for this is, you know, magazines of the 1920s. When there was a magazine boom between about 1890 and 1920, and in that period is when fashion was transformed. We went from that, you know, those old bustle dresses to, you know, flapper wear and to, you know, long hair. And women um, began to imagine themselves in terms set by the magazines. One of the things I do in a, one of the classes I teach is I show a bunch of photographs from the 1920s of just women. This is snapshots. I, I pulled them off of eBay, but they are imitating poses that they've seen in magazines. And you, you see that now, of course, with the duck face or other things in digital spaces, right? You know, every, every young person today has their best side. But I, I do think you're right that we have to, in some ways, first learn the genres and then unlearn them, learn how to be ourselves in relation to those genres. And I think one of the fantasies in American life is that we somehow internally ourselves precede the reality that surrounds us. I have some special spiritual characteristic. I am specially unique and I happen to be where I am and I should, I should change where I am. No, we're, we're built inside out of the architecture that we inhabit. We're built out of the images that we see. We form our sense of ourselves by looking in mirrors that other people hold up to us. You know, that's, that's, that's powerful stuff. But that's even more so speaks to the way in which we need to start to unpack the way that these technologies, especially these, you know, social, these, these ones meant to be social, that sort of present the appeal of a communitarian space and to really question how have they designed the society that we then walk into because we typically produce society by walking into it and then things emerge out of that right in this in this context it's a kind of reversal and i think that's what i'm trying to get at in terms of the the social politics of the context because when you are walking into a space and the society has been made for you that you then have to enact there's a loss of the ability to transform, right? To, to challenge or to develop something new unless you're given a new platform, a new technology, a new structure, in which case, what really changed but the space? So that can be true, but I don't think it's necessarily true. I think you might, my analogy for social media is, is the urban landscape, it's cities. When farmers moved into cities in the 19th century in the US, earlier other places, they had more constraints. They had to be in certain kinds of buildings. There were certain places that were marked as appropriate for some people and not for others. But they also could see new and different things and enact more cosmopolitan styles. They could become flaneurs. They could become cafe sitters. There was an array there for them that was different. And I think that in the social media world, things are both more constrained and generic and demanding that we perform inside that generic space but they also give us chances to tweak and play in a, in a new way. I think TikTok's a pretty good example of that. One of the things that I'm most interested in at the moment is, is an idea that I'm calling forced cosmopolitanism. And that's when media force you to encounter people who are so different from yourself that you would never encounter them in your local world. You know, I grew up in a really small rural town. And in that world, I would never have seen many of the kinds of people who I now see routinely on television or on the internet. And I find that fascinating. And it is true that the, the genres in which I see them are, are very constrained and constraining and encourage me to imagine producing myself in commercial terms. But at the same time, they show me a world that's much larger than the world I ever inhabited before. And, and I think one of the things that we haven't come to grips with is that freedom to see one another is actually deeply challenging and kind of painful. I think that's true. I guess I'm sort of cautious around it because this... There's a, I feel like there's this need to have a more liminal space here, right? It's so easy to fall into this kind of catastrophic versus utopic idealism around these technologies, right? And like you, I do think that they've served a lot of good, right? I think it's been very helpful for many people all over the world to be able to have some of these social platforms despite the constraints that they also impose. At the same time, I'm deeply uncomfortable with the idea that somehow because we get to see each other or because of these platforms, suddenly we could never see each other before in this way and this is this new world because 
whenever we start talking about new worlds, I question, you know, well, who is making the new worlds? What is being left behind? Who's being left behind? And does everyone want a new world? Is this new world inherently better because it's new? Right? There's all these other sets of questions that come up. And when, especially right now, I think there's a kind of revisiting of this utopic dialogue around technology for many reasons, um, not least of which the state of the world that we're in right now. And so there's a, there's a pull, right? There's a drive to imagine that maybe, maybe technologies can offer us this other better world. And I'm wondering how can we temper that? How can we, can we make technologies operate in a gray space? Well, that's a great question. I don't know the answer. I will tell you different, yeah, sorry. sorry. I'll tell you different answers that I've heard in, in, in my academic travels. So one answer that again was very popular in the 80s and is sort of one of the foundational ideas behind cultural studies as a field is that it's always gray. And that what looks like commercial space, you know, is always a liminal space. And that if it weren't a liminal space, you wouldn't enjoy it. So, you know, you watch a sitcom, it's only entertaining because it allows you to imagine in your mind being on multiple sides of an issue that in the real world, you only take one side of. So that idea is very popular. That travels a great deal. The other piece, the sense that we live inside a world in, online in which addiction has been built into us by design, to, say, to quote Natasha Scholl, that's really scary. And I do think that we have not figured out how to get past the nudge universe, the architected universe of desire stimulation, accelerated desire stimulation, accelerated attention recruiting, and life mining that is the business model for these, for these companies. And I think that's a real issue. What I wanna, what I wanna shift though is, I don't think it's, I think we sometimes use the word technology when what we really mean are predatory companies. <laughs> Fair, and, absolutely. Uh, and I, you know, I just want to kind of catch that. <laughs> I mean, I, I, and you're right, because of course, when we conflate the two, we also don't give them the, you know, technology is the opportunity to produce the positives that they can help produce. Um, I wonder- Or to think of, think of uses that we might use. I mean, we might, we might think of different collaborative communal uses for the same devices if we could sort of, separate them and the device possibilities from our sense of corporate obligation and solicited behaviors, the things that the system is asking us to do. Mm -hmm. I guess one of the things that I've been thinking about recently, because this year there's been so much um, sort of hopefulness around, you know, alternate spaces and in talking to, you know, young people about it in the sense that the systems that they have been surrounded with have failed them right, that governments have failed them, education has, healthcare has, any number of things that are part of the social fabric are no longer working for them in the way that they were told they would or that they feel like previous generations experienced and that even the environment in which they live seems to be on the brink of disaster and that this world, right, is a type of lost cause and that their voices or their aspirations can't exist here. But that in the space of technology, whether it's a predatory company or not, right, there is the opportunity to build something. And, they, and there's a sense that in that space, there's a future possible. And I'm wondering if this is something that you've encountered, right? And if so, I worry about it because we're still also gonna be here. And how do we make sure that we're bridging the two? I worry about this all the time. And my, do, my students do sometimes think that way. And then we argue about it and we go, go in different directions. There's a band called The Roaches, again, from you know, the 70s, 80s. And they used to have this line, it's silly to believe in stuff that happens on the stage. And I found that that's a pretty good principle for thinking about some of the performative aspects of social media. It is very easy to perform a political position on social media feel good about it, get applauded for it, and go back to your ordinary life without having changed anything except your perception of yourself. And you know, I think that there's a way in which online participation can absolutely shape a political consciousness. But then the real question is, how does that consciousness then connect to others in ways that lead to institutionalized action? And I say institutionalized action quite deliberately. One of the fantasies that undergirds the net, it comes from the 60s, is the idea that if we just get enough people like ourselves together, 
share our mindsets, share our consciousness, share our point of view, the world will begin to change because the world will be watching us and see us do this and say, well, of course, that's the right way to go. And it's just not so in any way. To, to make actual change, we need to, to make coalitions and then actually institutionalize those actions in ways that let us, and here's the hard part, work with and negotiate with those who are radically different than ourselves. One of the, the horrors of social media and of the mostly 60s ideologies that drove it early on is the fantasy that getting together people like ourselves and giving ourselves room to express together will change the world. That's, I mean, that's the same principle that underlines redlining. That's, that's an essentially fundamentally discriminatory principle. And we see it all through our society today. My question is, how do we create spaces online that then encourage us to get offline and to work with those whose views we find most reprehensible? How do I have a conversation with a racist? How do I have a conversation with a working class man who is enraged at having lost his job and who no longer has the standing in his family that he might have had in the past, but whom many in my tribe would offhandedly refer to as heteronormative? What do I do with that? We need to build places where those conversations happen. I think that's absolutely critical. Last thought, we need to not only have the conversation, we need to have institutions that can distribute resources and provide negotiation settings for that happens. One of the things that makes me most upset these days is simply the capture of our democratic apparatus by wealthy companies and, and other actors. I mean, we're becoming a kleptocracy on the, on the Russian model. That's a, that's a serious problem. And that's a problem that will not be solved by the expression of my interior psychological condition online. A lot of what you said made me think of Chantal Mouffe, the political theorist, has you know, speaks at great length about this notion of agonism. And I'm so grateful for this idea and for the way she's really tried to push it, because I think it speaks to part of what's at stake here, which is that we need to become more comfortable with the idea that different points of perspective will occupy a standing, you know, space in political life that will then have to shift, that there's always this kind of compromising and adapting that's going on across all of these different positions. In contrast to antagonism, which presents this sort of binary where there's you and there's me and one of us is going to win and then I've just got to hold on to make sure you never come back, right? And it seems as if in many ways, like what's underlying all of this is this kind of antagonistic, you know, political and social expression that then, you know, in, in theory, somehow you're expressing your personal psychological selves is this kind of shift away from that. But that actually what's at stake here is recognizing that there's lots of different voices that need to be expressed and that they need to be expressed at different times with different amounts of focus. What I'm curious about is whether when we have these kinds of ideas, right? This is what I was speaking about with like, the way a social person can come in and produce society versus operating within structures where you are constrained by the structure itself to what you can produce. I'm wondering whether these types of ideas that theorists and scholars like yourself and that many people are trying to put out there can actually become a part of a future when so much of the way we've become accustomed to engaging starts within an established software and a set of designed interactions? I think that's such an important question. So let me start with a, a brief critique, critique of Chantal Mouffe. Um, I, think, I think her theories are, are broadly correct, but the, the, the thing that I, I disagree with is the notion that sociability and a healthy society and diversity within a society, the full array of peopleness, occurs as a matter of positioning and voicing. Positioning and voicing is the language that we use mostly coming from feminism, queer rights, um, and before that from information theory. It's a long history. I'm in the middle of writing it. It's quite a story. That's, that's a very elite kind of way of looking at the world. It only makes sense if you've got your food covered, your rent covered, and you know the basics in hand. I can think about my positionality after I'm eating. And what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that large parts of America are not eating. Here in Silicon Valley, one in five families are food insecure. We have 74 billionaires in this valley and, and one out of five Americans are insecure. One out of five families here are food insecure. We have the largest number of Superfund sites in Santa Clara County, one of the two counties that make up Silicon Valley, 
of any place in America. We are one of the most, we are the most polluted county in America. And yet those kinds of things will never be um, negotiable if we focus on expression and position. We need to understand that agonism is the interpersonal corollary of and required for the negotiation of the distribution of resources. We need to be able to hold people to account to prevent them from polluting. We also need to be able to say, no, you don't get to make $10 billion. You only get eight. And you have to give two of, that, two of those 10 billion to somebody else. And I know you don't want to do it, but I'm going to muster the force of the state to make you do it. The, the mustering my voices and telling you this, it's the right thing to do is not going to make you do it, I assure you. No multi-billionaire is going to give up that last billion just because we say it's the right thing to do. But, but isn't it interesting, of course, that the state is the one that has to have the voice to be able to speak to that other voice that doesn't want to share its you know, extra billion dollars. I mean, I think it's interesting that we come back to this notion of, you know, the voice and of speech acts, right? In the context of thinking about how is it that the arts can communicate differently? And, you know, I, I think frequently about the fact that Norbert Wiener and sort of conceiving of cybernetics depended to a degree on the ideas of Freud and Bergson, right? And various scholars have written about this, but of course they themselves were depending on the experiences and thoughts that they were having in relation to artists using new media like you know, photo cameras and like film cameras and that the use that the artists were making of those new emerging artistic creative technologies produced ways of seeing the world and ways of thinking the world that influenced these philosophers that then influenced this way of thinking that transformed the world in which we live now, right? What I love about art is when art is really cooking, I think it produces, you know, prototypes. It produces social prototypes, models of ways that we could be if we could, if we could sort of take it out of the theater or out of the box, out of the, out of the white cube, you know, and go out into the world. I could see like that. I could learn to move like that. Oh gosh, I could collaborate like that. But I, I, I do think, I, I want to offer a comparison here from within the arts that I think might be valuable between Barbara Kruger, who's, and I admire Barbara Kruger a great deal, but Barbara Kruger takes up images, tweaks them in ways that critique commercial worlds, but also replicate their norms. Compare her to Suzanne Lacey, who is a feminist, arguably performance artist, collaborative kind of performance artist, similar period. Suzanne Lacey is gathering women of every different social class, bringing them together, having them talk to one another, literally building the coalitions and the spaces within which we can be talking across great differences and perhaps even surfacing the differences in resources that we have. If art can do that, it doesn't become agitprop, but it does give us a chance to imagine something that I think you were pointing to earlier, new structures within which we can form publics and give collective oomph to actions that we care about. The thing that I'm struggling with, and it's not with you, it's with, it's with Silicon Valley, I've critiqued you know, the, the structures that social media produces and I've critiqued the ideas underlying them, and I don't like them and I think they are a problem, but it's a little bit like I'm, I'm looking at a kind of digital city and I'm seeing the walls being built, but what's really scary to me is not the walls, it's the invaders coming in from the right who are genuinely seeking an authoritarian religious society. And in some, sometimes I get, I don't know how to think about how digital media, the walls, the kinds of conversations we can have in those spaces connect to, don't connect to, will help us prevent the takeover of our country by essentially right-wing autocrats and kleptocrats. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons that encouraging a kind of critique is so important right now, right? I mean, we've largely been talking about critiquing, you know, predatory tech companies, um, but I mean, I, we can equally talk about why it's important to critique art, right? Why it's important to critique, you know, sitcoms, right? That actually a culture of critique is potentially the space in which we can begin to imagine something other. Um, we, I, I, there is a sense I get sometimes that we live in a world that is afraid of critique because it feels as if it reiterates that kind of antagonism that has become so much a part of our political reality and that that's not getting us anywhere. And to try and like, you know, break down the difference between this sort of antagonistic, you know, feuding and critique, I mean, 
Is there a social media out there that's encouraging critique? Because if there is, I would love to have more people on it. Well, the founders of Twitter would tell you that they are. I don't think I agree. But they, um, but there are certainly people on Black Twitter who would say that you know finally Twitter is the medium of critique for for formerly disenfranchised Black Americans, and that might be true to a degree. I, I'm not sure. Um, I'm interested in a different role for the arts. You know, I'm struck that much of the power of social media today depends on its ability to solicit, contain, constrain, and then remarket our attention, and the arts for a variety of reasons, they need to seek markets, they need to get attention to, have been oriented towards getting our attention and that's fine, that's part of, part of the business. But can we through art do things together or imagine things together that aren't about soliciting unidirectional attention towards some global project of emotional resource extraction, but it are instead about collaboration and connection across difference. Can we find a space? Can we make art in which the iron worker and the professor are in the same place? The only place I experience that right now is in, is in the, the church that my family and I belong to, a radical Methodist church called Glide in San Francisco. And that's a place where everybody from, comes from all classes, all social strata, all um, sexual persuasions. It's just not an issue. But it's the only place in my life where that's true. And I think art could be, and performance could be, and poetry could be places where we invite diverse others, as Suzanne Lacey did in the 70s. I mean, don't you think that that's one of the arguments that gets made about what social media is? That, you know, side by side are these incredibly different people who are, you know, sharing their lives and their experiences? I think it's a marketing campaign for social media, um, uh, but I don't think it's a fact. Um, and, and, and there's two, there's a contradictory story about social media that we haven't sussed out yet. And that is on the one hand, people like Eli Perez are argued that it produces filter bubbles and we get trapped in our solitude. Other folks have argued and, and shown, I think maybe more persuasively that in fact, social media show us lots of other kinds of people as we connect. And it's actually very difficult for us because we perceive them as though they were right here in the room with us, but in fact, they're not, and they're quite different than us. And oh gosh, that difference feels threatening. I'm not sure which it is, but I'm very confident that social media are not providing the civic space that their marketers promised us. So I, I mean, I guess the question I have then, I mean, because I agree with you on that, right? But I think one of the things that I've heard people say sometimes about why they don't want to have these types of artistic experiences that you're describing is that they're tired. Life is really hard. They're working really hard. It's the end of the day and they're really tired. They don't want to participate in one more thing. And Participation is a part of it. I, 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 take, I take the point. I'm tired too. Let me tell you, you know, a couple of years of COVID and it's just like drain me out. I feel like, you know, I'm not the ever ready, ever ready bunny, but good art rejuvenates. Good art makes you feel at home. Good art fills you up like a great meal. Good art brings you together with people that you never knew you needed to talk with. But boy, when you talk with them, those are the people I need to be with. You know, I was really beat yesterday. I went to a show in San Jose, San Jose Museum of Art, spectacular show, went out for Mexican food afterwards and went to bed feeling like a fuller person than I did at the start of the day. And I, I think, I don't think art has to be super fancy. I, I think, you know, we can each make some part of our lives out of art. We don't have to be Judy Chicago. You know, we can set a meal. We can make our own meals. You know, we don't have to invoke large tech. We can make our own alternatives. I also think one of the challenges for those of us in the critique business is to figure out how to think about modes of critique and modes of art, art making that energize people unlike ourselves. You know, like I'm watching a lot of TikTok these days and I, I have zero desire to do a TikTok dance, though my students would like to see me do one. <laughs> I, I, just zero I think desire. a lot but, of people would like to see you do a TikTok dance. If you oh, I'm feel sure so that's inspired. wrong, but thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure that's deeply wrong, but thank you. Uh, but, I, but I mean, you know, but, but it's really fun to see what 16, 17, 18 year olds think is, is critical. They'll talk politics and then they'll do like a little Dougie thing, you know, and you're like, what? You know, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Well, I mean, I think, you know, as much as I might want to have you do a TikTok dance as a part of this ending, I'm not going to force that on you. Um, though you never know, part two could be us dancing 
Um, you know, we can do t we can do TikTok critique together, <gasps> right? I mean that that could be little six second insights. Little, you know, six seconds for me, six seconds for you, back and <laughs> forth. See, but this is also. I mean, I, I guess I'll say this is one of the things that you know, a creative practice and the arts encourage people to do, right? They break what it is that the model has designed for them. And I think that that's one of the things that, you know, to your point, it doesn't have to be a pressured thing, but the arts do allow and do present ways in which we can begin to break out. Um, I love the idea of a creative practice. I think that's great. I think that's accessible to everyone. It's by nature democratic. And then I just say, yes, please, to everyone, develop a creative practice and then invite your weird neighbor in to do it with you. Well, thank you for being my weird neighbor today. I really appreciated the conversation. Um, I hope you have a thank wonderful you, day. I feel lucky to be here. Talk to you next time. Culture and creativity connect us. But sometimes we get locked out of big decisions about the culture of our own neighborhoods. That's why we built Culture Steak, a totally new way to choose the culture and creativity we want together. Culture Steak is all about showing how you feel. Rather than putting a check in a box, you allocate vibe credits. The more credits, the more positive the vibe. But here's the clever part. You can't allocate them evenly. That means you've got to show not just what you feel good about, but how good you feel about it too. And the feels don't stop there. Because as well as feeling kind of great, you get to pick arts and activities for where you live. You'll feel more plugged in to your local culture and community. Find out how you can culture stake in your community by visiting culturestake.org. to stay. It's your culture. It's your call. The World Wide Web is centered around tech giants. We are all citizens of Google and Apple. Some of us are happier, fitter, more productive. But we are all dependent, monetized, surveilled. Bitcoin paved the way to fight back against censorship. It was followed by Ethereum, which evolved the concept of decentralized apps. But while the blockchain technology is still in its infancy, it has already experienced its own concentration of power. In proof-of-stake blockchains, the voting power depends on the amount of money. In proof-of-work blockchains, the voting power depends on the computing power, which is also a form of money. Consensus mechanics based on money lead to plutocracy and extreme concentration of power. To avoid this, a different type of resource is required. It should be accessible and equally distributed across all people. We believe this resource is personhood. IDENA is the first human-centric blockchain where every participant has equal voting power and equal mining income, no matter the size of their stake or the power of their computer. To prove your personhood, no personal data is needed. Instead, all individuals need to appear online within a strictly set interval of time and prove their uniqueness by solving a series of flip tests. The ceremony is held simultaneously around the world. In America, in the morning. In Europe, in the afternoon. In Asia, in the evening. This makes it impossible to get many accounts. AI-resistant flip tests do not allow algorithmic bots to pass validation. Personhood is the DNA of the IDENA ecosystem. It makes IDENA one of the most decentralized blockchains. Thousands of individuals running their nodes guarantee the blockchain consistency, ensure its governance, and enable horizontal scalability. Let's reveal the potential of digital personhood together. Fair governance? quadratic funding of common goods, and universal basic income are just a tip of the iceberg. Join the democratic borderless world.
Hello everyone, I'm Sushant Kumar, uh, Director of Responsible Technology with Omidyar Network. And today I have with me uh, Paul Romer, the Nobel Prize winning economist who has uh, spoken about uh, the data economy, has uh, uh, published about digital advertising taxes as well. And we have Tim O'Reilly, the CEO and Chairman of O'Reilly Media. If you have heard about uh, uh, Web 2.0, that came from Tim. And today we have Paul and Tim um, and Matt talk about how do we build a better data economy. At Omidyar Network, we believe that the current data economy is structured to create inequitable outcomes. Um, some stakeholders benefit at the cost of others. And therefore, how do we work towards building a world whether, where all stakeholders of the data economy, whether these are consumers, businesses, communities, countries, they can all be better off. Businesses can build more sustainable business models. Uh, consumers can be protected from harm. Workers in the data economy can have better living conditions, better wages, and their data can work in favor of them and not against them. Our work on new data paradigm is thinking about upstream questions of what are the assumptions about data? For example, is data property? Is data labor? Is data a resource? Um, and the metaphors associated with it in popular dictionary, like is data oil? How, how are these metaphors, how are these assumptions driving some of the, uh, some of the outcomes that we see today? So without further ado, I would uh, invite Paul to talk about a broad framework on how do we think about this paradigm of data economy and how do we start to peel the layers on building a better data economy. Paul, over to you uh, to talk okay. about your framework. Great. Um, so the the contribution I made to economics was to sharpen this distinction between objects and ideas. And what we need to do now is figure out where data fits in in that dichotomy and what the implications are of the massive potential for the collection of, of data. If I can go back just a bit, um, one of the most important insights in economics is that in the world of objects, a lot of things can go wrong if no one has property rights. If there's a common pasture that everybody can turn their animals out into to graze, nobody owns it, nobody takes responsibility for it, you overgraze it, everyone suffers. So there's a deep insight and a lot of uh, thought that's gone into this general result that property rights, together with a kind of a market arrangement with competition, is a good way to deal with many kinds of problems. The point of telling that story is to underline the fact that this logic doesn't carry over into this world of ideas. If someone discovers a formula, like the formula for what's known as oral rehydration therapy, it's a way to make a liquid that you can give to a child who's sick with cholera, save the child's life. Um, you want to encourage the discovery of an idea like that recipe, but then once it's been discovered, you want no one to control it, you want it to be available for free all over the world. There's no overgrazing in the world of ideas. So the first caution is we need to be careful about not, we need to avoid just you know, mechanically transposing insights like, oh, stronger property rights are a good idea into this, this new world of ideas versus objects. Now, um, the the the, what's the danger of the economics of ideas? Um, if, if a firm can control ideas uh, or control things like code, which codifies ideas, that firm can then take over the entire industry. Uh, if it's ahead of other firms, it can become the dominant firm and, and just wipe out all of the competition. So one of the assumptions that economists relied on 
to say all oh, property rights lead to good outcomes was this notion that there'll tend to be lots of firms competing in any industry. And if it's possible for firms to get control of ideas where you can reuse the idea over and over again for every customer, for every unit you sell, um, the ideas can create increasing returns that lead to dominance by a single firm, what we now call winner-take-all competition. There's a way to avoid this, which is to push all the ideas into the realm of science. If every new discovery, like the, the formula for oral rehydration therapy, were, um, were put into the public domain, nobody would get special advantage because of that discovery. So science is a very powerful and socially beneficial way, not only to discover new ideas, but to make sure that the benefits from those ideas are, are widely shared. And what we're struggling with now is not just the kind of the discovery of insights like ideas, like formulas, but it's also uh, the collection of data. Uh, let me explain the distinction. Uh, another formula is if you take um, uh, copper and tin, mix them together, you get bronze. Now, what's the value of that idea? The value is related to the quantity of copper and tin you have access to. And, you know, when you start out, all you've got is like a bunch of dirt in the Earth's crust. Data is when you take objects, like a pile of dirt, and you put a label on it. And you say, oh, this is copper ore. And another pile, this is iron ore, or uh, maybe iron, but then you find some of this is tin. Um, the, the labeling of the objects, and the labels are specific to the objects, but they give you the hook where now the, the idea can be applied to the, uh, to the physical objects. And what's changed in the last uh, 20 years is not just that we've got IT that makes it very easy to codify insights in code, but we've now got this, these systems, the mobile phone especially, but the computer, the, mo the personal computer as well. We have these systems now which can be used to put those tags onto every human on earth. The, we've turned everybody into something where we can get collect data on them and then feed them into the formulas that, that firms um, infer. So getting back to that science solution would be a lot tougher now. We not only need to force into the open like the basic insights about how you do machine learning, but we need to force into the open all the data that all of these firms have collected from all of their devices. I forgot to mention cars. Cars are now devices that are collecting data on us, just like phones and, and, and computers. And you know, other, uh, every piece of electronics will be like this. So um, uh, we can see a vision that's like the science world of open knowledge about insights, code and uh, ideas and open access to data, um, and one where there's competition and sharing of the benefits from uh, these, these intangibles. But it's gonna take uh, a real policy push to force uh, things out into the open and to stop a few giant firms from controlling all of this data. I saw this presentation by somebody from Uber who was saying to a bunch of academics, uh, if you want to study autonomous vehicles, you've got to come work for, uh, for us. We will have the best data about vehicles, better than anyone else will ever have, and it will be impossible to do research in universities anymore. Uh, you really want to come, come learn from us. And, and this just sounded terrifying to me. Like, how are we going to have regulators who can regulate a firm like, like Uber? If in fact, all of the research, all the discovery uh, be, is proprietized and kept internal to these, these firms that the VCs are helping uh, to take over the world. Yeah. Tim, you've spoken about uh, the need to build a better data economy, the need to govern some of these data sets better. And uh, I, I, I wouldn't go as far as to say regulate these uh, businesses at this stage. But could you talk about uh, uh, why you feel we need to build a better data economy and how would businesses and tech players like Uber and Google be partners in building this better data economy? Yeah, let me start by giving a broad framing of, uh, and, and this in many ways is, is based on you know, Paul's work and, and, and the work of others. 
And that is, uh, you know, this this positive externality from ideas. You know, it makes uh, new ideas make us all wealthier, right? Um, and to the extent that they're widely disseminated. But there is this idea in economics, uh, you know, of, of what, what are referred to as Schumpeterian rents after Joseph Schumpeter, uh, which is that for a period of time, uh, a company that comes up with an innovative idea is able to extract extra normal profits uh, because they have this advantage that comes from the new idea. And those extraordinary rents eventually get competed away you know, as, as the idea disseminates and other people are able to do the same thing. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, is that happening in the data economy or is it not? You know, is it are these rents being competed away? And, uh, you know, it's very hard to say over the long term, uh, it's likely that they will be. But the question is, how are these companies establishing a moat? Uh, you know, Google definitely was better at search. Amazon was also better at search. I think one of the things that was really interesting, if you look back at my work 17 years ago now on what we call Web 2.0, it was really hey, these companies survived the dot-com bust because they really had invented something new, which was harnessing big data. You know, I called it uh, you know, harnessing collective intelligence, you know, where they were taking all the data from the market and they were really figuring out how to give you better results. And when I think about these companies and the incredible innovation in terms of the data economy that we, we, we saw, we got a taste of, it was really the first, I think, large scale market without money. We've had markets without money in the past, but never have we seen something the scale of, of Google search where, you know, hundreds of millions of information providers providing effectively trillions of products, i.e. individual pages, are being matched up with billions of consumers using signals, not one of which is price. You know, it was, uh, Google had figured out this way. You can figure out hundreds of different signals to say this is the best result. And then they had this very clever innovation, which is, well, we'll, we'll put on a sidecar market of advertising uh, that, uh, you know, where we can actually make money to fund this thing. But it, it, it's really kept separate from this uh, unpriced next economy market of ideas and information. And I thought that was the, the best thing ever. Now, Amazon had a slightly different flavor because they actually blended price in, but price was simply one of the factors. Now, now roll forward to today, and uh, you know what you see is that Google has substituted increasingly over the last 10 years, the, the second part of their life cycle, they've substituted two things, their own data products, uh, and secondly, paid for advertising products for what used to be called organic search results. So they've actually reverted to the old model. And Amazon too, advertising is now their, their uh, you know, fastest growing business. Uh, they have this massive global marketplace, but now instead of using collective intelligence to give you the best results, they're using uh, 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 their position that they've, uh, they've acquired uh, to, to actually extract rents from, um, uh, you know, from their marketplace. So I, I'm writing a paper right now that I'm calling uh, Rising Tide Rents, which are those positive externalities of innovation, and Robber Baron Rents, which are the kind that, 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 that you know, we, you think of where, uh, you know, the Baron's men ride up and say, I'll, I'll take half your crops and your daughter too, because these are my soldiers, right? And you know, we, so we have this enormous market power now that has allowed these companies to say, well, you know, we're gonna put our product first. Oh, we're gonna make you pay us if you wanna be first. And that behavior is so sad to me because we had a taste of this innovation. We had a taste of, um, of a better data economy. And, and I think what I, I see is that you have this rising tide in, in, in with new ideas and companies are getting these super normal profits from the rising tide and their role in helping create it. 
And at some point that growth slows, but our overall imperative of our financial system is you must keep growing your profits uh, because of the, the, the financialization of, of the economy. And as a result, they say, well, we can't get those rising tide, uh, uh, you, know, we're, we're, you know, the innovation isn't keeping up with the, our size, our growth. Uh, so now we're gonna have to do these other things. And so I, I think that this is an interesting piece of work to be done to understand what causes that transition. But also then it's really the time when, as the market matures, you really need a lot more regulation to say, oh, wait, you, uh, you, you used to do this thing that was really, a, a, you know, had all these positive externalities and now you've shifted over and we're gonna have to restrain you from using the power that you accumulated in this very beneficial way and instead get you to, uh, you know, to in some ways hold to that uh, truth that you must be doing these things for the benefit of users. Uh, that was how you got ahead. You know, Google said, this is the best result for you. And now they say, this is the best result for us. And, and so that leads me to a general principle, how I think about the data economy, which is that, uh, you know, we, we have a, a lot of smoke in the air. We need to own our data. Uh, you know, this, you know, people are abusing our personal data. And those things may be true uh, to some extent, but I think far more importantly is uh, to ask these, to say to these companies, you have this data in trust, uh, you know, our, 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 you know and, and you need to use it for the benefit of your users. Just like, uh, you know, like if, uh, if a, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a bank, you know, the financial system is, is sort of in some ways an earlier incarnation of this. Uh, we give them our money and uh, if they abscond with it and use it, it you know, uh, in ways that we didn't intend them to use it, that's not a good thing. If they, uh, if they, use, if they use our data to give us, uh, uh, you know, our personal data to give us a mortgage, uh, you know, because they, they've assessed our risk correctly. Uh, we go, wow, that's great. If they use, uh, actually, it's kind of interesting because often it's not personal data. It's maybe biased uh, aggregate data that they use to deny us credit sometimes, uh, Ill, you know, illegally. So there's a lot of real nuance in here that we have to explore. But for me, the touchstone is, uh, is this sort of custodial sense of, of are companies using data for our benefit or are they using it against us for their own benefit? This is RxC Voice, an in-house radical exchange creation using quadratic voting that makes democratic decision-making accessible, participatory, and fun.
if, if I could just make one other observation about kind of the broad sweep of history, the, the, the discovery of ideas and the sharing of ideas creates this really powerful sense of or p potential for increasing returns. The more people we interact with, the more different discoveries we're going to be able to share in. So over the course of human history, we moved from hunter-gatherer bands to settlements and then cities, and the scale of interaction went up. When the scale got bigger, uh, we had to d develop new systems of, of governance, which basically protected each individual from some of the harms of, of scale. So when we moved into cities, we had to figure out public health to pe get people, keep people from dying of, of, of cholera. So we need to think of the government as really the expression of the interests of everyone and the protection of their interests in, in a new domain. And as Tim was also suggesting, um, we moved into this, this huge expansion of scale that's now global in its extent. It's, you know, it's all seven or eight billion people on the planet who are now potential you know, targets in these, in these digital markets. And our systems of governance just haven't kept up with this new, this new scale. So we got to figure out the analogs of how do you have public health? How do you have also just streets where people can get around in cities? We need to have that new rethink about uh, how do we make sure that we get the benefits of scale and the benefits of the kind of discoveries Tim was pointing to without, uh, without the harms. Well, just one small tweak on the wording. I don't like calling that regulation because regulation is like the, the, the bad word these days. And it, it imposes certain kinds of assumptions about how it plays out. But just think about governance, governance that protects everyone. Yeah. Go ahead. Add uh, this. I love what you're saying there, Paul, because I think when we think about this as a problem of the companies, you know, we have to regulate the companies and keep them from doing bad behavior. Uh, you know, it, that's a very, very different problem definition than, as you describe, actually the governance of the system at its new scale, you know, and, and your examples of public health and roads and infrastructure for uh, sort of shared prosperity is a fantastic model. I, I've never heard that expressed that way before. And I, I think, boy, if, if we were to frame the new data paradigm that way, that's yeah. just brilliant. Well, and, and, and let me say um, that, uh, you know, part of why I, I think cities are a good analog here, you picked up on this right away, is that, you know, in the, adva in, in the advance of cities, economists, if, you, if they had existed, if you asked them, would have said, oh, yeah, no, no, the market can deliver, you know, roads for you, the market can deliver connectivity. That just turned out to be completely false. The government played this essential role in laying down the grid which was the analog of the internet, like the rectangular grid of streets in New York City, that was provided for by the government who said, you can build on the, the other stuff, but you can't interfere with the grid because this is how y'all are gonna be able to connect with each other and, and produce value. And so there's, there's an important potential that goes beyond regulation, which might be the provision by the government of certain kinds of platform or infrastructure connectivity kinds of services uh, the kind of a public option you can think of it. And that, that takes us beyond just the mere thought of regulation. We know very little about how value gets created in the data economy and specifically what role does data and code play in sort of generating profits for the large platforms. Uh, where, what do you attribute this lack of uh, knowledge to? Is it, is it uh, because the economists have not gotten to it yet? Because uh, the tech players are not transparent enough in terms of reporting what's necessary for uh, economists to peel the, peel the layers on this question? How, how do you think about it, Tim? The example of, of Uber and autonomous vehicles is they have a different type of data than say Waymo, which has invested very heavily in LiDAR and so on. Uh, they have a different kind of data than Tesla, which has another different approach. And if all these companies were, in, in fact, sharing data rather than saying, oh, this is going to be part of our proprietary moat, uh, we'd actually see faster progress in the, in the field. So, it, it, you know, it's one of these uh, kinds of medicine that would be good for the companies. But let me come back uh, to the, this 
broader question of disclosure and how we get there, and in particular, the question of how data is monetized. Uh, I, I, I've been working on a paper which is coming out in a few weeks about, uh, it's really kind of a, 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 it's trying to use a particular piece of SEC regula regulation as a model for, for how to start to attack uh, this problem. And that is the idea of segment reporting, which is that, it, you know, if, if, if a, um, you know, it's, it's, it's rules going back to 1969 in big, big uh, conglomerates, they say, okay, well, if you're playing in multiple markets and something represents uh, more than, you know, 10% of your revenue or profits, you should break it out as a separate segment. Well, uh, you know, if you look at tech, take, let's take Alphabet, for example, it has uh, you know, more than uh, nine products with, with over a billion users each, for which there is no reporting. Uh, you, uh, we just learned that, for example, the App Store uh, at Apple represents 20% of their profit. But they say, oh, it's part of our integrated system. So we have this, uh, th this sense that th there's all these moving parts. You know, how are those nine products with a billion users at Alphabet actually monetized? You know, we know that search is the primary monetization engine, um, but we uh, and we know the ads, you know, in, in particular. But we don't actually, you know, Google says we have only one business; it's advertising. You know, whereas if they were forced to disclose, okay, well, here's how the Google, the, the data from Gmail contributes to the advertising business. Here's how the data from uh, Google Maps is used in 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 our travel search and local search and whatever, you know, you'd all of a sudden have this sort of set of disclosure requirements. This is, oh, actually, these products actually compete in different markets and they are being monetized through search. So tell us how and, and how much. And so that's really the point of this paper that we're working on. Yeah. And, and you know, if I can kind of just keep going in this direction of like things we could start to think about, there's lots of directions where we could force more, more disclosure. Another one I just want to flag is political advertising. I think it's incredibly dangerous to have firms displaying targeted ads where the public never sees what did this candidate say to that narrow group. And, you know, Facebook has said, well, we're they're the leaders in the political advertising. And they said, well, we'll give you kind of voluntary disclosure. But they get to decide which are the political ads that they're going to tell you about and which ones are not. I think that we should, as a society, just say it's absolutely a requirement to continue in the business you're in for you to disclose information about every single ad that you displayed, however you categorize it, and at least basic demographic information of who it was displayed to. Because if this is really serving the function that they claim it is, just providing useful information to people, there's no reason why uh, the firms or Facebook should want to keep secret the useful information that they're disclosing. So there's a long way we could go to get more uh, dis disclosure out here. One of the things that uh, comes out uh, when you talk about political ads that you, is that you see that the boundaries are very uh, gray. You know, is, yeah. is a uh, an environmental ad? I mean, climate change is a political issue now. So, is is an environmental ad, or an ad for, uh, you know, advocate any kind of advocacy ad in some sense becomes a political ad, and so that leads oh, back sure. to your or point even, about or even, global government. This is really about global yeah. governance. Wherever you start, yeah. you end up back at that big picture. And, and like just, even ads that like send you to a quote a publication, which is like a fake, you know, like simulation yeah. of a newspaper, which is then providing a bunch of uh, political advertising. I mean, so it's just a very gray um, area. So yeah, just universal disinformation too. You know, I, you, know you, you look at the fact that most of the anti-vax sites uh, are actually, uh, you know, operated by Russia and China. You know, it's like, I think it's only out of the list of the top 40, only two of them are, are organic. Uh, and, and, you know, that kind of stuff, should be disclosed, and we start to get into that question of global governance. Sorry, but I, I derailed you there. Yeah, well, I just wanted to say there is this other direction of the like thinking about the streets and the public option. Um, like, so take your your point about search. It was true that the you know Google was the best early on at search, but imagine we had just 
had a blanket prohibition. It's impossible for any firm to make money in the search business. So Google abandons it, they go off to something else. We could have created a version of Wikipedia that did search for us, just like Wikipedia provides these other uh, beneficial um, information services. And you know we, that might have happened just organically the way it did at Wikipedia, or it could have been subsidized through the mechanisms of science or like the mechanisms like, like open source. So I think we should also be thinking about the creation of parallel um, like uh, uh, public options that uh, put some kind of a check on what how abusive, say, like search can get at, at, at Google. I, I never use Google search anymore. It never gives me what I want. But, you know, a public option would put a check on, on them and, you know, would give us a way to just naturally uh, surface information and make progress the way science makes progress, the way open source makes progress. Well, I, I, I have to disagree with you here, uh, Paul, okay. for the first time. I, I, I really believe that uh, most of the time when we get a public option that is trying to substitute for sort of an innovative uh, good, it doesn't really work. And this was even true of, of open source. You think about open source software, we're going to go, OK, we're going to have uh, Linux be the replacement for Windows. None of that Linux desktop stuff ever actually took over the world. Uh, we, you know, we're going to have the GIMP be a replacement for Photoshop. It's just not the right way to go. I think the right way to go is is you go, great, innovate, go. But you have responsibility when you have that great power and the more you have that power, more, that power, uh, uh, the more you have that responsibility. And, and of course, there is a long term market check on Google, as you say, as they've substituted paid results and their own, you know, uh, you know, pinned results for organic search, uh, their results are getting worse and the market is going to check them eventually. And they will, in fact, uh, have more competition. But I do think that the the so I just kind of think that the, uh, you know, you, you, your idea of the equivalent of streets, I'm not sure saying you can't, you know, the, there's just no monopoly on search. You know, you can still have private roads. You know, yeah, just, we're gonna, yeah. I, hey, think, we're gonna I think that's really. The, we're going to invest in the roads that are not being built that enable new things. And so there's sort of probably classes yeah. of search that the public option could have said, OK, yep. now that we know how to do this thing, mm -hmm. you've shown us how to do it, but you're not really searching over here. Um, yeah. You know, so on. That yeah. would be. So, yeah. So I think I think where we might kind of kind of converge is that um, this this idea of like pro prohibiting private activity is probably a bad idea. You're shutting down yeah. a source of innovation and discovery. But but offering a public option like subsidizing Linux, you know, that might be a, a, a good thing. And then something oh, good, good comes out of it. This might be one of these things like the glass half full or half empty. You yeah. know, I, I back when I was like with working with justice on the Microsoft case, I thought, you know, like you were saying, like open source, it's never going to amount. They're never going to produce an operating system, for God's sakes. I mean, think about how complicated that is. But yet, you know, uh, open source is the basis for all the server operating systems now and the whole Mac OS operating system. So, so you know, uh, open source, yeah, open yeah, source has done a lot better than I expected. Yeah. Yeah. yeah all, all I was reacting to was the pro prohibiting uh, a company from doing something rather than saying we're going to leapfrog this because that was really, you know, for me, that was the opportunity of open source. It was it was to become the basis for a new generation of things. And I think that's what we need to think about here, too. You know, we could create a public service which helps match people who want to request a car and then have a car pick up that request and, and drive them. And they could feed those requests into Lyft or Uber, but they could feed them to the taxi service. Uh, the, you know, the public could start to provide this option of the, you know, the connector point or the platform that does the, the connection. And, or, or you know, it might not take off. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, which yeah, is, you know, it really kind of like we, we need to establish a Nash equilibrium that says everybody drives on the same side of the street. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, what does that look yeah. like for data? <laughs> yep. Wonderful. So the fascinating conversation on the on creating parallel public options for shaping innovation. 
I think that's that's a thread that we can continue to discuss and um, further uh, evaluate as well. Um, Paul, you've also spoken about very specific policy interventions like uh, taxes on digital mm-hmm. advertising. There are other uh, specific policy recommendations like Radical Exchange has uh, put forth a Data Freedom Act that talks mm-hmm. about putting in place intermediaries that act as uh, uh, trusted intermediaries or play a fiduciary role uh, uh, as, as an intermediary of data. There are a few others which are sort of here and now solutions uh, for moving towards a more desirable data economy. If you had yeah. to pick up a f- one or two such suggestions for uh, governance, and, and Tim, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll pose this to you as well, um, yeah. but if you had to pick one or two such interventions uh, for governing the data economy, what would, what would you pick yeah. and why? Um, so I think the first thing I would, I would encourage everybody to think about is not just a dichotomy of public versus private, but um, within the private sector, think about the not-for-profit private versus the for-profit private. If you go back to what our insurance system and healthcare system looked like in the era of the Blue Cross Blue Shield organizations, uh, before, unfortunately, Wall Street privatized and destroyed all these nonprofits and turned them into these predators, we had a very vibrant system of not-for-profit insurance providers that was really very healthy and provided real services to people. So I think we can think about, and then, you know, take, I'll say, Consumer Reports as another kind of not-for-profit whose function is to try and provide uh, reliable information to, to, to members. It's always tough to find a viable revenue stream that keep these not-for-profits open and, and, and vibrant and, um, you know, successful. But I, I think we should think hard about ways to encourage more of these not-for-profits. And I would lump, say, Wikipedia in under that category of a a a huge very important organization which has spun up which just has a different culture and a different motivation than the the rest of the industry so one think about other ways for people to work collectively together to achieve an end rather than just through the government and tim uh, same question posed to you as well what are one or two interventions that you would propose for governing data well, it's kind of interesting because the interventions that I'm thinking about uh, fall into two big categories. And, and uh, uh, probably the thing I'm actually most excited about is an architectural change in the information economy that I see coming. Uh, because hmm. I, I actually think that the, the architecture, the design, the shape of systems really influences what becomes possible. And, you know, if I look back through my career, you know, I I think about these big stages in the computer industry. There's the mainframe era, uh, which was dominated by IBM through control over hardware. Uh, That was blown up accidentally because IBM, there was this new market that was still very small, the personal computer, and they basically trying to play catch up. They came up with a a PC made out of commodity parts with a standardized design. They released that design uh, in such a way that, you know, say Michael Dell as a a student at University of Texas could just, uh, you know, build PCs in his dorm room and launch this big company, broke up the that dominance of of IBM uh, over hardware. You know, Microsoft re-centralizes you know, so it's really an architectural change in, in how computing was delivered with personal computing. Then uh, Microsoft figures out how we can re-centralize by controlling the operating system. Uh, you, know, you know, first DOS and then Windows become the thing that everybody has to use. And, and then open source and the open protocols of the Internet provide this new standardized architecture of communication centric applications, uh, built everything up again. Uh, and what do we see? Once again, companies figure out how to re-centralize power, this time through big data and, and, and network effects and, and various ways of imposing switching costs from, say, the different ecosystems. Um, and now we're at a point where I think we're at another moment that's a little bit like 
what happened with uh, the IBM PC, which is that uh, these large language models that have been developed, you know, you, you probably all heard about GPT-3, uh, but the one that I've actually found really, really interesting is a somewhat smaller earlier one, which is BERT. Because BERT released, uh, I mean, Google released BERT as open source. And it's interesting, at O'Reilly, we've been working with a small company called Ask Miso, which has built uh, a business around, uh, tr you know, taking BERT, which is a large, a, a large language model uh, based on, you know, effectively, it's Google in an AI model. You know, it's learned from every web page. Uh, and then they say, okay, well, let's train it on your data, whether it's, you know, like uh, in the case of O'Reilly, it's the corpus on the O'Reilly learning platform, uh, books, videos, and so on. And suddenly we are better at searching our own data than Google is because of something they put out as open source. Uh, Miso is working with a lot of e-commerce providers, same kind of thing. They can do in, in better search than Amazon. So there's this architectural change that's implicit in machine learning. When, when Once these models get released out into the wild, they've actually incorporated vast amounts of the knowledge that used to be that proprietary advantage of, of the big data companies, but it's now encapsulated in this in in this in this uh, language model. So I think these what sometimes what people are calling foundation models are are going to be really transformative in terms of the architecture of the data economy in ways that we don't understand yet. All I know is that, you know, before I felt, you know, like with search on our platform, we're using solar, the open source, open source search engine. And, you know, you address this parameter and something else goes whack and you have this team playing whack-a-mole trying to get better results. And you realize just how hard a problem search is. And suddenly with this machine learning based model uh, where, where so much is already encapsulated and so much knowledge, it's just easy suddenly to produce really, really good search results on your data. And I think there's a revolution coming there uh, that uh, uh, is going to take us in the direction that I think that Stuart Russell talked about in his book, uh, Human Compatible, which is about AI, which is that really everybody needs to have their own AI um, that's working for them as opposed to working for the man, so to speak. And we may be heading in that direction where we'll get enough sophistication into a distributed network of of, um, of, of you know, machine learning agents that work for us individually, rather than this idea that somehow we have to have a data collective or we have to own the data. It's no, we, if we own the model and the model is trained, the model is trained on everything that Google knows, and now it's trained on just the things that we only know about ourselves, it becomes the best source of information about us. And I'm super excited about just seeing that unfold. Yeah. So, Sean, if I can say, um, like this point that Tim just made was the most interesting thing I, I learned from the last uh, meeting that Amidia arranged, where I had a chance to, to talk with him. And I've been racing to get to know more about this area since I learned about this from him. Let me let me suggest one thing I think that we could do collectively to encourage this. Part of why a company like Google will publish information about uh, BERT or something like that is that its engineers want to get some of the recognition that comes from uh, you know, being cited in the scientific literature or winning a race versus other companies and the, you know, the effectiveness of their, you know, these, these systems. Um, so the, the existence of the system of science and the open source system, where there are, you know, these open competitors that are trying to, to do a better job than, you know, the big players in, in this, you know, understanding um, language. Open source creates pressure where to keep their employees happy Google allows some publication and you know there's some disclosure into the public sector. Now, as I listen to people in a community like Python, where you know it's been an incredibly successful open source effort, there are a lot of signs of real desperation amongst people who are striving with no resources to keep this thing going. 
So I think you put those two ideas together. We should be thinking hard about government subsidies that instead of just going to professors in universities could actually subsidize powerfully important new open source resorts and, and partly based on the success of the take up of, of some of these ideas. I think a small amount of additional resources that people in the open source world could compete for could really help keep that sector alive and then keep firms like Facebook and Google feeling like they got to allow some disclosure because their employees really want the prestige and status that comes from participating in this other thing. So it's really important that we keep it alive and we just can't let that open source sector die. And Tim, I don't know what you're hearing, but I, I'm hearing from a lot of people who are uh, really uh, feeling, I think, desperate about can they keep this going? Yeah, I think that's right. And, and some of that has to do with the aging of the uh, uh, of people who've been in in some of these communities. You know, you're young, uh, you, you don't need much, uh, you know, um, you know, you, you, you work all night and, you know, and uh, uh, you get older, you have a family and you go, wait, I can't just keep going at this pace uh, just for the love of it. And, and I think that that's, you know, that's part of the life cycle of some of these technologies that government should spend a lot more time doing. And, and we could have come a lot further uh, if we had had more tech savvy people in government back at the beginning, because when you set uh, the terms of engagement early, you know, as when, you know, you lay out the street grid, uh, you have a much bigger influence than if you try to retrofit it later. And, uh, you know, Robert Moses, notwithstanding, you know, you end up with, with or actually maybe Robert Moses is the example of what happens when you have uh, the city come in and, and over. But um, yeah, but when know, people don't know what they're doing, you try and yeah, dictate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so if you think about I remember back when I was first writing about data, you know, and, and its importance in the early, you know, after the turn of the millennium. You know, one of the things I'm saying is we're going to we're building a new Internet operating system. It's made of data. It's going to have basic primitives, you know, identity, location, um, you know, value. You know, there's all these these subsystems. And that was the time when government should have said, oh, wait, OK, we want identity to be something that's common and public and shared and nobody should own it. We shouldn't have this race to say, okay, you're gonna sign in with Google. You're gonna sign in with Facebook. We're, they're gonna own our, you know, our identity. Oh, you know, uh, somebody's gonna own payment. You know, we said, no, we want all this stuff to be interoperable. And that would have been an example of streets right away. We want actually everybody to have an identity that's recognized by the government, you know, today. Right. You know, and we're, we're, we're crawling our way back in that direction. But 15 years ago would have been the time to lay down that grid of streets by saying, yeah, well, there's also kind of a thing, a, a kind of foresight, uh, you know, to pick up my point of the right time to sort of standardize on the some of the, the public options for data would have been 15 years ago. Well, I go, what is at that stage today where we should be thinking about the architecture of the system? And, and so for, for me, synthetic biology is one of those areas. You know, cryptocurrency is one of those areas. Um, you know, um, the, 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 you know, there's probably even some things in, uh, you know, in, uh, you know, machine learning driven logistics where we could, you know, what's out at the cutting edge where there should be a body of people in government saying, you know, self-driving cars, what do we want to have as the equivalent of the street grid? One question that I have is thinking about the um, thinking about the sort of different uh, places where power can coagulate in the data economy. So um, one thing that you've talked about is the idea of sort of proprietary networks that give you know an advantage to whoever's able to assemble the biggest network. Um, but touching on the theme of like uh, uh, machine learning models or personal models, um, looking looking just over the horizon, um, I have a little bit of worry that those could become another sort of uh, choke point. So for example, if, um, uh, you know, one scenario, and I'm not exactly sure how it'll play out, but I could imagine a scenario where uh, 
there's like an arms race for compute power, for example, so that, um, you know, whomever is able to marshal the most resources and throw the most compute power at a particular set of even public data will essentially be first past the poll and will be able to concentrate the lion's share of the value of, of that public data. I'm not so worried about the kind of the concentration and say the pure making progress on, on machine learning. Um, I'm more worried about uh, concentration and the control of access to the data. Mm -hmm. So I think it's data, not CPU or, you know, like machine learning, you know, software, but it's access to data where I think the, you know, the choke points are going to be. So uh, I, I, I think I'm going to disagree with you again, Paul, here. Uh, first okay. off, my, my thought is uh, there will always be a choke point and somebody will figure it out uh, over time. I am deeply influenced by uh, Clay Christensen's Law of Conservation of Attractive Profits, where he says uh, whenever uh, something becomes uh, sort of standard and commoditized, an opportunity um, you know, arises to you know, get uh, attractive profits at an adjacent stage. You know? So uh, you know, back to, you know, we, we, we kind of had a mind mail back when I was sort of writing about this IBM to Microsoft to the internet transition. And he, uh, it was exactly the same thing he was talking about. And like, okay, uh, hardware became a commodity, software became valuable, software became a commodity, commoditized by the internet, uh, data became valuable. And I think we see this, uh, you know, this new choke point, maybe most clearly with cryptocurrencies where, it's not, you know, compute power, in fact, did, you know, become the new choke point. And I, I do think that we, uh, you may be on to something there. Uh, although I do think that, the, the, you know, it's hard to say, you know, the, the, the creation of some of these large language models, once they, they take enormous amount of compute power to, to create, but they take a lot less uh, to build on once you actually have them. So, um, but there is kind of an interesting thing there, you know, back to the public option, you know, when, when open AI started to say, well, we're going to be there to create uh, this kind of stuff in uh, as a public good. And then sort of like was pretty, you know, uh, was pretty quickly, they were not so open anymore. And it was maybe a little more proprietary. And that would have been a great opportunity for, you know, for example, for government funding to say, yeah, we really do want this. Let's, uh, let's partner with you. And let's really make this a, a public option. Um, so I think identifying those choke points, and you know, and in the case of it, if it is massive amounts of compute power, you kind of go, well, government could subsidize massive amounts of compute power for a public purpose and and make sure that there's always an option uh, where it's not like, well, you have to be uh, one of these uh, big companies to be able to actually marshal enough power to, to play. Uh, if that's the choke point, uh, government can say, oh, yeah, we're going to we're going to invest in a public option. So I, I, I think I share Tim's in, intuition that you always reach a new choke point uh, sooner or later. And so sometimes the way I think about this problem and other problems is just the idea that you sort of want to, uh, you know, make the periods of time between choke points last longer and make the periods of time where we've, you know, come into some new choke point uh, not last a decade or something, right? Um, and, and I think that... Um, you know, I mean, that's one way of understanding kind of what's gone wrong in the data economy is we've we've let a choke point last last too long, and I I think that um, you know, going back to the idea of of intermediaries, uh, I look at the idea of of kind of a new establishing a class of like nonprofit or you know or otherwise kind of carefully regulated intermediaries representing. Um, uh, representing broader interests in the data economy as a way of um, uh, potentially mitigating the the choke point beyond the choke point we can foresee, right? It, it, by by sort of lodging a little bit of of, of power into a more distributed, um, uh, or by locking in slightly more distributed power, uh, hopefully you set the stage to not get blindsided by 
you know, whatever that choke point that we can't quite foresee is. How will governance evolve in the next couple decades? I think uh, one thing we're going to see is uh, demand for more effective governance in this realm of public health and in cyber security, protection from cyber threats. So the United States has had good success with what they call mission-oriented basic research. So it wasn't just basic research done by the NSF that was just, just go find good things and we don't care uh, how. We've had a history of agencies that had problems to solve and funded basic research to address those problems. And data and could be very important for, for public health. And we've got this huge gap on cybersecurity. So we may see some expansion of the government uh, role in protecting us in those two domains. And those might be one of the ways we build up some more capacity within the government and indirectly subsidize open source. The other thing, and this is more speculative, but when I look at the failures of the COVID uh, pandemic, I think we made a huge mistake with the single points of failure of a national FDA and a national CDC. And if we're smart, I think we'll go back to the system that we had uh, in the 19th century, where instead of saying, let's build a national university that you know is really best in the world, what we said is, let's build a university in every state. And so, uh, again, this is speculative, but if we learn the lesson, we might have a little bit more of a distributed system of governance, which is active on health and, and cybersecurity, but with expertise that's spread amongst the, the 50 states, maybe with funding that's actually distributed by the, by the national government. And those might be kind of connection points uh, for some of the things we're talking about here, but they may also be one of the most effective ways to encourage some support for this vibrant open source community. Absolutely, and I think uh, uh, on both cyber and health, it's also a global issue in terms of how data flows um, and how, what, what, uh, uh, how collaboration can take place amongst uh, and between countries and continents. So on that point, and thinking about the earlier discussion on choke points as well, uh, given the unique nature of sort of the, China, the internet uh, in China or data governance in China, uh, there's a European model, there's what's emerging in the US right now, and with the new context that you talk about, Paul, which is uh, cyber uh, security and health. Uh, given that data is viewed as sort of a resource and an asset that needs to be protected and monetized as sort of the basic assumptions, leading to uh, data becoming a geopolitical issue. Um, how, how, how should we think about moving this towards sort of a more collaborative uh, world, not just within yeah. countries, but outside borders as well? Yeah, I mean, this, this might sound a little bit facetious, but I'm actually serious. I'm, I'm really interested in trying to get much more participation in open source amongst young people in, in China. I think there are subtle but very powerful long-term benefits that could come from, um, from this. Uh, because, you know, I, I think it could undercut a little bit this, this growing sense of, you know, proprietary control is good, and it's, you know, it's the country that controls the most data which is gonna win and this sense of rivalry. Science and open source are one of the effective ways to cross borders on this, and, um, I think, honestly, one of the good signs about developments in China is that the government there has been willing to take on the very biggest firms and say, you've got to operate under a rule of law, especially a rule of law as it, opposed, as it applies to the financial sector. The, China's, the Chinese government's done a better job of that, frankly, than we have. So I'm, I'm not as pessimistic as many people are, but I do think we want to steer this away from this sense that... Uh, you know, kind of proprietary control of like, you know, data is the new oil uh, is the way for nations to succeed. We really want to think about the way everybody succeeds is by effectively exploiting scale. Yeah. Uh, can I add to that? Uh, and in some ways, it's circling back to Paul's original, uh, you know, really big idea here, which is this is the public infrastructure of the next, you know, uh, century. 
which is that it's a lot easier to build that infrastructure, to envision that infrastructure when you still have some green field. So I, you know, and then you can bleed it back into other parts of the economy. And I, I think one of my big takeaways from this conversation is that focusing excessively on the, the areas that are already a problem uh, is, is going to lead us to miss the opportunity uh, to get things right in some new emerging areas. You know, so if you think, for example, about uh, public health, you go, okay, well, we're going to ha we're having all these revolutions in uh, personalized medicine, in uh, uh, the ability to develop, uh, you know, ra rapidly new uh, vaccines. You know, I mean, you know, the, the fact is, we could be building a, a generalized public vaccine development infrastructure. There's one other point that I think worth keeping in mind. Um, that we may have more open space in places outside of say the US or China. Um, I, I think that Adhar system in India is one of the huge successes in the last couple of decades. And it's really still very focused on, you know, physical presence. But, um, you know, if you go back to the questions you were raising about we, how we failed to, you know, really think ahead about uh, identity and control of identity, um, uh, there may be opportunities in other parts of the world to innovate in a way where doing it in the, the leading countries is really pretty tough. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I think that's true in areas like, uh, you know, thinking about like, we're gonna have to rebuild our uh, energy grid, uh, but it's gonna be a lot easier to build a decentralized, uh, you know, green energy grid in countries that didn't already have one. And uh, so I think that's a really interesting point to bring in that international dimension. We also saw the adoption of, uh, you know, digital cash uh, much more quickly in in areas where we didn't have existing credit cards, uh, so on. So I, I, that's a really good point. So thinking about, well, what are the greenfield opportunities? Uh, what are the challenges of the uh, of, of new things in the 21st century. And again, maybe even identity, you know, one of the things, massive refugee mo uh, movements driven by climate change as an opportunity for uh, digital identity. You know, like what's the, you know, what's the LinkedIn for refugees that's gonna help match them with opportunities uh, and give them, give them an, an, an identity. Uh, you know, again, when I think about all the people who are like, oh, we're going to build this, the, the 21st century tech city, I go build it, build, make a refugee camp be that uh, 21st century city. And, and, and then you're solving really interesting problems. And so for me, looking forward into areas where we can say, yes, it, this thing is still being formed. What's the 21st century equivalent of the street grid that we would be building? Uh, what's the 21st century equivalent of the public health, uh, you know, infrastructure that we would that we should be building uh, as we go into these, um, uh, you know, new areas? And, and just to drive home my point about kind of devolving decision making, we didn't get at har because uh, the UN or the World Bank or the IMF you know, centralized the whole strategy for this. We, we got it because some smart people in India saw an opportunity and ran with it. And uh, so I think we want to encourage that kind of innovation in the space of governance, new institutions, maybe new nonprofit type or social organizations. Uh, we want to kind of let, you know, many flowers bloom all over the world and not not go to this this mistake of, oh, we need some kind of global centralized control over all of this. Yeah, I just wanted to, one along the lines of these sort of new opportunities. I wanted to throw out there uh, one that I think is is important and isn't isn't being talked about quite enough, which is uh, which is the idea of um, uh, people sharing uh, private data for purposes of federated learning um, through you know with with through networks that um, use privacy enhancing technologies. And so, you know, provide people sort of guarantees about how that data can be used that are more robust than anything we've seen before. Um, I think that the emergence of, of these kinds of networks is actually a, a possible avenue for larger, deeper, more robust 
uh, data sets to become available than even the data sets that you know the biggest companies uh, have at their disposal uh, right now. Um, so you can imagine you can imagine lots and lots of people um, you know sort of just through these kinds of private data networks entrusting very very deep rich data uh, to uh, nodes that sort of gate that to uh, to like end users or people who want to train models on it. And so you could, he, here you can imagine another um, another sort of uh, choke point emerging, right? Because if you've if you've got lots and lots of people contributing data to particular nodes that allow users to train models on it, um, that you know that those nodes could 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 quickly uh, establish network effects and become, you know, for example, the only place that academics can go to do serious research of a particular kind or something like that. Matt, it's been a pleasure being part of this uh, conversation. Some of the big ideas uh, that I'll surely take away from this uh, are uh, related to getting things right in the new emerging areas. Uh, you spoke about uh, health, cybersecurity, uh, biology and whatnot, and also about creating effective parallel public options in a more decentralized uh, manner. This has been wonderful. We are certainly richer as we think about uh, the new paradigm for data. Absolutely a, a pleasure to, uh, to do this. Super honored that you were all able to take the time. Thank you. ITS is an independent research center located in Rio de Janeiro with global activities. We focus on understanding the frontiers between technology and society to maximize the benefits for society, especially the global south, and to address the challenges of technology on society. How do we use technology to make citizens closer to governments? Well, one thing we can do is to make government sexy is to make participative process more easy for people to join and be satisfied with. This is why, for example, we create projects that will use technology and mobile phones, for example, for people to send message, co-create, crowdsource things with the governments. So people believe they are more included in governments and they have a better trust on democratic institutions. Hi, my name is Austin and I'm a co-founder of Ampled. Today, I want to talk to you about our product, our mission, and how you could become involved in our co-op today and help participate as a community member. The music industry doesn't work for artists. Last year, musicians made only 12% of all music industry revenues. 12. And another scary number is 2020. That's the year that we're living in. And the primary revenue source for artists of live performance and touring has pretty much all but disappeared. And we have no idea when the end um, of this crisis is in sight. So the problem is that musicians aren't paid equitably and giving direct support to them is difficult. If we look at existing market trends, we see physical and digital sales continue to decline and streaming rates continue to go from bad to worse. So we have this opportunity that artists need support, artists want support, from the way that they're recording and releasing music, they often have surplus content that doesn't live on other platforms. And their listeners are often eager to directly support their favorite artist, especially if it's through an organization that they feel like aligns with their values. Ampled is a web platform that allows musicians to be directly supported by their community with simple, direct, recurring monthly payments. So Ampled is like a Patreon for music as a co-op. That means it's collectively owned by its artists and workers. So Ampled's mission is to make music more equitable for artists and to operate transparently and ethically. Here's how it works. Here's a product page of Ziemba, who is an artist owner of Ampled. Um, artists create a page for free and post unique or exclusive content, um, which is available to the public or either for their supporters only. And each artist can be supported directly for $3 a month or whatever people would want above that. And the average support amount right now is about $6.
So here's an example of how the content works. This is Renee Klajic's page. Um, she goes by the name Ziemba. She's an artist owner of Ample and just released a new album. And on her Ample page, she's posting demos and alternate versions of all the songs before they come out. The co-op model actually helps unlock a number of unique competitive advantages against a really large company. So Ample is owned by its artists and workers rather than Patreon, which is owned by VC and private equity investors. This means that value at Ample is captured by artists rather than extracted from them. Economic rewards are shared by many rather than concentrated to few. But we're motivated by service to members rather than growing and serving financial maximization. Our revenue model isn't a rent-seeking platform fee. It's a commons contribution that artists pay to help build and grow the platforms that they own. Our goal is sustainable independence rather than selling the company or going public. And we make decisions democratically rather than autocratically. So we see this play out in a number of ways that make Ampled significantly more attractive to musicians. In terms of governance and decision-making and ownership, artists have a say in all of it. Um, we are financially transparent and our accountability interests are structurally aligned amongst stakeholders and it's all built on a foundational mission and ethos that aligns with artists and people are paying attention so we've received uh, write-ups in a number of of uh, press outlets uh, we've been a part of start co-op and new inc which is the cultural incubator as part of the new museum in new york city our favorite um Hyperbolic headline that we've received was how a punk inspired collective beat the streaming giants at their own game. Um, to be clear, this is not a picture of us. Uh, Lizzie No is a um, Queens based Americana singer songwriter, uh, is an artist owner of Ampled. And she's receiving um, enough support that's actually fully paying her rent through the platform right now. And she says, Up until now, my idea of success was to play music and not have a day job. It seemed impossible to fathom. But thanks to Ample, that this happened in the past month. Our team um, looks and feels more like a collective than a traditional startup. We have over 30 people helping build and grow Ampled um, and investing their time and labor through a time banking system that we made. Um, and we have senior employees from Kickstarter, Spotify, and Patreon, to name a few. This is a bit of an unusual pitch in that we're not asking for investment, we're actually asking for participation. So we want to ask you to become a part of our co-op as a community member. We have artist owners, worker owners, and we've carved out this third stakeholder group um, called community members. And you can become a community member by going to this website, ample.com slash community, and supporting the platform and us directly for $3 a month or whatever you'd want above that. This is our way of aligning accountability with our community rather than VC investors. So when you become a community member, you can get a seat at the table. This means you can run for a board of directors or vote for the, in the board elections. You can have decision-making power. So important co-op decisions will actually go by you and you will be able to su uh, submit your ideas as proposals. You'll get insider access, which means you can unlock content that we're posting on this page, which will give uh, insights to people and operations on Ampled, and we'll post polls to get feedback on key strategic decisions. And you'll get access to the team so you can join our Slack and join in kind of our everyday conversation. So again, I want to invite you to become a community member. Um, we're helping make music more equitable for artists. And beyond that, we are hoping to also do something better which is by aligning the co-op model with the scale of the web to generate a reshaping of corporate governance and human organization that we haven't really seen before. And we want to invite you to become a part of that and help build it together. So, thank you. I'm joined today by Anasuya Sengupta, who is co-director and co-founder of Who's Knowledge. She has led initiatives in India and the USA, 
across the global south and internationally for over 20 years to amplify marginalized voices in virtual and physical worlds. She's the former chief grant making officer at Wikimedia Foundation and the former regional program director at the Global Fund for Women. Anasuya is a 2017 Shuttleworth Foundation Fellow and received a 2018 Internet and Society Award from the Oxford Internet Institute. Alongside many other uh, honors, she's a, an accomplished uh, poet and author. But I, I would actually love also to hear in your own words how you sort of see your, uh, your work. One of the ways that I think about what I do right now is to connect unlikely uh, allies and unlikely uh, co-conspirators across different worlds, different communities and different spaces. And I do that primarily as co-founder and co-director of Who's Knowledge, which is, as you said, a global multilingual campaign and a feminist collective to center the knowledges of marginalized communities um, online. And by marginalized, we mean marginalized by historical and ongoing structures of power and privilege. So really the minoritized majority of the world. In order to do this, we are centered very much in a uh, in a sense of knowledge justice and of making sure that we are uh, honoring, amplifying and leading with the design and imagination of those who have been marginalized so far. It seems to me that whose knowledge work, whose knowledge's work connects fairly intimately to the question of digital infrastructure, the way that we communicate with one another online and in sort of new and emerging um, spaces. I wonder if you could say a little bit about how how you view the. I mean, this is a this is a really big question, obviously. But um, you know how when, when you sort of look back on the past, like you know, twenty five years of of the internet, how do you view it as interacting with these structures of of uh, of privilege and, and marginalization? 25 years, it's, uh, it feels both like forever and yesterday in one breath, right? It's so interesting, um, especially at this time where time is both stretched and compressed simultaneously. Um, I was amongst the first generations in India to study computer science in school. We actually got to use computers. We, of course, had to share them because they were a precious, precious resource. I remember we had to make sure that we took off our shoes whenever we went into the computer lab because, you know, those three computers that about 10 of us were sharing um, were such a precious and at that time really cutting edge technology for us. And yet I was privileged to be part of the generation that could study computer science at school. And that was because even though I was from a middle class family, I was so-called upper caste um, or what we say uh, is Savarna. And the caste system, as you know, is an extremely pernicious um, and deeply oppressive social structure that has been around for millennia. And so recognizing that as I experienced different forms of discrimination as a woman in a patriarchal society, as a middle class person who had certain uh, spaces denied me because of uh, my lack of resources or uh, the choices I could make, I could still make many more choices than the Dalit or Muslim or indigenous or Adivasi in, in, in our context, we call them Adivasis, the first inhabitants of South Asia, of India. And so growing up, I recognized, even in my own living, this simultaneity of being both in positions of power and dispower, in positions of privilege and disprivileged based on context. And most importantly, as we were discovering this new digital world, I was simultaneously feeling that sense of being on the margins looking in. My national newspapers essentially talked about the rest of the world as the center, right? Europe and North America was the center of the world. We in India were looking into that center from the peripheries. We were never included unless the stories were about poverty 
or about um, some horrific uh, natural disaster or engineered man-made, man-made disaster. And so all of these different elements of being um, in that first generation to understand technological infrastructure, participate in being online, uh, to start coding, um, to start being involved in a more global digital world, and yet to continue to feel different forms of marginalization is part of the experience that I bring to the work that I do today. And when we think about digital infrastructure, I think the way that I sometimes uh, think of infrastructure itself, as many infrastructure scholars have talked about it, I find it useful to think about it as the underlying systems that we often forget exist and we only see when they break down, right? In many ways, the internet is that now, 25 years on. And yet COVID has been such an extraordinarily good and brutal example of what happens when those infrastructures break down or what happens when those infrastructures are far more inequitable than we already think. Just to recognize that the internet or at least different forms of digital connectivity are primarily led by the global south. That is, most of the people who are online today are connected digitally in some way are from the global south. 75% of those online uh, are from the global south. And over 60% of the world is digitally connected, even if most of them are through a mobile phone. So very particular ways of being connected. Um, More than 45% of all women are connected. And yet, even today, the internet to me, as a relatively privileged brown woman from the global south, feels like my old newspaper, right? It feels like I'm still on the margins of the world looking in. I can access it, but once I get online, the content online, the the platforms online, the apps that I use are not designed with me or for me. The content is not about me or about my communities. I'm continuing to be on the margins looking in. And if that is true for me, how much more is it true for those who are far more marginalized and disprivileged than me. And that's really the sort of sense of critique around digital infrastructure that I bring. And at the same time, the sense of hope because digital infrastructures, because the technological infrastructures that we have today also give us the potential for bringing all of our different embodied selves online in very rich textured ways that just a telephone or just the telegraph may not have. But we have not yet realized that potential. And that's that's the, that feels like my day job and my night job right now. Yeah. So it seems like, you know, when you look at many different aspects of digital infrastructure, there seem to be lots and lots of structures that have this feature of somehow encouraging, like, reification of biases that are already there. So like a simple example of this would be algorithms that pick up on discriminatory patterns that that already exist and then use them to make predictions and 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 thus uh make worse the uh the the thing that they're trying to predict. I think that these these structures of sort of reification go beyond mere algorithms, right? So like for example, you have written about Wikipedia's vast majority of editors are white men from Europe and North America. How do you think about about breaking down these these structures of of reification, whether they're algorithmic or whether they're just social, like in this in the way that Wikipedia is? Algorithmic is also social, (laughs) Um, as we know. The way that I think about it is that when you look from the back end to the front end of the internet, at every point, there are choices we have made about who designs, who leads, and whose imagination is at the core of the architecture of the internet. Those choices have often been led by historical structures of colonialism and capitalism, There is a reason why there have been 
white men from Europe and North America at the heart of some of these uh, technologies. And even the white women who were involved have been forgotten. And certainly the black women who were involved have been forgotten. One of the things we forget when we talk about sort of the back end and the front end as user experience is what's in the middle. So if you can get online, access itself, as we know, is deeply problematic and differentiated. But if we can get online, what is the content that we experience? What is the content that we see? Whose knowledge do we see online? And Wikipedia is a really good proxy for that because, of course, it is unlike you know most other top 20 websites in the world, it is a community project. It is a free and open source project. It's built on free and open source software. It is uh, based on the amazing and dedicated work of volunteers around the world. And it continues to have the uh, elements of structural power that you were speaking of. While I was at the Wikimedia Foundation, we started disaggregating some of the data around both content and contributors. And um, there's a lot of data around this, but suffice it to say, even the broad aspects of it are quite shocking, which is that the encyclopedia that we imagine is the encyclopedia of the world is still deeply limited in who contributes. So mostly white men from North America and Europe. Only one in 10 um, of the contributors are projected to identify female. Uh, 20% of the world, mostly based in Europe and North America, writes about 80% of the world, right? Um, there are more articles about Antarctica that are geotagged on uh, Wikipedia than about all the uh, countries in Africa. Just to recognize that the internet not just sometimes reifies and reflects the, the power dynamics and inequities of our physical worlds, but in some ways exacerbates it even further because we have a mythos around the internet being democratic and emancipatory and a place of possible global solidarity. It's not that it is not I mean, you and I are talking right now across time zones, across continents. Uh, we met digitally. We've never met in person, right? We've uh, pursued our common interests digitally, as many of us have over the last few years and really over the last 20 years. And yet, even as we have the possibility of that, if we continue to assume that all that the internet is, is a space of possible emancipation and uh, democracy without really looking at these power dynamics, especially around content. I think we do ourselves a great disservice. Yeah. So the, uh, the communication scholar, Fred Turner, kind of tells a narrative that has helped me think about this, which is... Basically, uh, you know, for the benefit of the audience, it's it's this idea that there was a sort of a an ethos of pro democratic media that emerged in the middle of the 20th century in the United States, almost as a form of kind of democratic propaganda, which 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 had this quality of like allowing the experiencer of the media to sort of make their own way through it. It's a sort of like choose your own adventure media experience type of a thing. <laughs> And, and that, that aesthetic led to this sort of 1960s, uh, uh, aesthetic of like the open, you know, the, like the, the, the be in and the, and the happening and the sort of like unstructured environment, which was meant to embody a democratic ethos. But in fact, in many cases, these led to, you know, things like like the sort of canonical case would be like the sort of uh, uh, 1970s commune, which, it has, you know, having been sort of uh, stripped of all old institutions, like now just becomes a place of like where, where like, you know, 
uh, power and privilege in the sense of race and 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 gender just are just sort of like running rampant. Okay, you sort of pull down the these old institutions and create something that you that you intend to be open or democratic, but it actually what it does is it just sort of clears the space for other forms of privilege to be to like express themselves even more strongly. What I'm trying to say is I worry about this in a lot of different contexts, but I think my question is how do you think about about that tension when we pull down old institutional structures that might themselves be be oppressive or or uh, flawed or, or or something, you know, and then that can create the space for unforeseen types of oppression. How do you think about that? For additional context, like Fred, when Fred Turner writes about this, you know, Fred Turner kind of believes in in the sort of traditional structures of the state. Basically, I might it might be slightly uh, might not be representing Fred perfectly. So, Fred, if you're listening, I apologize. But you know, the, there's like you know, what, one way of dealing with that is to say, like, well, no, look, we need these we need these traditional structures of the state that protect rights. They give people the opportunity to file a grievance and say and say, like, look, you know, my rights are not being are not being respected in, in this in whatever space I'm in. And if we don't have that, then uh, then things things get worse. I absolutely think there's there's a place for that, but I'm also I have to admit I'm also interested in in the idea of of creating like you know more radically decentralized spaces that also respect rights. Um, but I don't know exactly how to do that. I'm trying to figure out how to do that, um, as I think many other people are. And I, I'm curious if you have thoughts about you know like what does that what does that look like? Does do do we is this just a matter of not pulling down old structures that play an important role, or is it a matter of like envisioning uh, the the uh, institutions that respect dignity and protect rights in 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 new spaces? That's actually a really good set of observations um, and thoughts, Matt, and it's something I think about a great deal. You know. Fred Turner was from Counterculture to Cyberculture is an excellent book for anyone who wants to understand the history of the internet and understand why it's important for us to know this history. Um, And I think there's a very great truth in the fact that what then ends up getting embedded within the technologies and infrastructures of the internet are values of what we sometimes politically called libertarianism, but essentially are like values of individual freedom, individual agency, without always seeing those in context of the structures of power and privilege that give you certain kinds of individual freedoms and individual agencies. And when you have the imaginations of those who come out of those that ethos um, designing these digital technologies, then what you end up with is a user experience that is entirely based on those values. So the way I think about it uh, to offer the counter example is what would happen if a group of indigenous techies from the Pacific Islands were to have designed the internet, were to have first sort of thought about how TCP IP would work, what BGP looks like, what, you know, uh, network systems feel like, uh, and then how the web uh, works, what hyperlinks uh, feel like, how, how do we navigate between web pages. I think that would be a very interesting way in what, in, in the values that would be at the core of that design. I would imagine that some of those values would be deep collective interconnectedness, an honoring of sentience that is beyond just human, not to honor the the sort of assumed sentience of the machine in the ways that, you know, the folks, the singularity folks might think, most frightening concept in the world. But anyway... Um, I love that, you know, we, we're thinking about machine sentience when we don't even sort of humanize each other and humanize other forms of sentience that exist in the world. 
uh, indigenous knowledge systems, many indigenous knowledge systems, they're not monolithic, of course, for instance, recognize and remind us that humans are the youngest form of life on this planet, that every other form of life are our elders. So what would that form of epistemic knowledge of ways of knowing, doing, and being have meant for the values of an internet or a digital infrastructure created that way, right? So that counterfactual I'm offering as a way to imagine what might have been different depending on who had constructed this internet. At the same time, you know, Fred Turner is right also, the internet would not be here, at least our present form of the internet wouldn't be here without public funding. I mean, the internet comes out of defense funding in the United States. And so much of the internet around the world, just reminding those who 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 may not be internet infrastructure scholars that it's what at the moment, the internet is more than 70,000 networks connected around the world. Um, so much of it has been through public funding. And yet what happens when we either root our understanding of the internet in the individual or in the institution, which is to say, we think of all states as the same, all corporates as the same, all nonprofits as the same, is that we forget to analyze both the intention of the technology, the design of the technology, and the impact of the technology, right? Or equally, the intention of the use and control and the impact of the use and control. So when you talk about decentralized systems, for instance, I would rather ask us to imagine a world in which our internet infrastructures are distributed, that they have different nodes of centralization and decentralization based on what we are trying to do. Like small communities cannot. I mean, it is very difficult for them to handle some of the economies of scale that are offered by a centralized node. However, if that centralized node is oppressive, then we know that small communities do really, really amazing hacks around connectivity around uh, across the last mile, mesh networks, you know, local networks. But that is not necessarily the way that all networks need to be. What happens when you have, on the other hand, rather than this kind of crazy vacuuming up of humans as data that the big proprietary companies do, but rather smaller distributed data sets governed by the communities from which that data comes. What does that mean for our algorithmic world? How, how does that change from, you know, the, the experience of algorithmic oppression to algorithmic justice, for instance? So, so I, I'm in fact using uh, a, f a, a concept that my partner actually uses because he is an in internet infrastructure scholar. Uh, you might want to have him on at some point, Matt, but um, he calls it distributed governance, right? Rather than centralized governance or decentralized governance, infrastructures like the internet need a form of distribution where based on what we need them for, we have nodes of centralization and, and uh, the spread of decentralization. The other way that I also think about it is how do we make sure that those who are not yet visible in this leadership and governance are talking to each other so that they're building solidarity, they're building a critical mass, they're building the power to push back to resist because we're resisting a bunch of things right now. We're resisting the actual everyday oppression that big tech has over us, the ways that we are no longer even consumers, but actually data points. We are resisting the ways big tech's lack of care and duty of care makes our everyday experience on the internet often deeply violent and painful. We are resisting the fact 
that we don't see ourselves on the internet in terms of public knowledge. We are resisting the fact that these technologies are often alien to the ways that we think and work and do, and that we have to learn to do them that way. We are resisting the fact that the internet is incredibly monolingual rather than representing over 7,000 languages that humans speak and communicate with. So we're resisting all these different structural elements of power and privilege. And the only ways that I can think about that resistance being powerful is in this form of not just distributed governance, but distributed imagination and distributed resistance. When it comes to like organizing distributed resistance, what does that look like? And or when you think about the basic architectural decisions in the systems that we build, you know, what, how can some of those be improved? Like, so, you know, what, I, just one thing I have in the back of my mind here is, you know, the idea of, of one-way links versus two-way links, right? There's this guy, Ted Nelson, who, you know, back in the day had this idea that links should always go two ways so that information always retains its context. When you were talking about, you know, what would the internet look like if it was designed by a different culture or something, that's the kind of thing that I think of. At the same time, I actually think that that's not, not it's maybe not that radical. Like, you know, Ted, Ted Nelson is, is still just like a white guy from Northern California who had a kind of interesting idea. Like indigenous Pacific Islanders that designed the internet, they would have done something much more radical. You know, so like, what does it, yeah, what does it look like? It's really amusing you say this because I met Ted Nelson at one point at the Internet Archive, Friday lunch at the Internet Archive where you meet everyone. And I remember having this really interesting conversation with him where I was talking about the politics of the internet. And he kept saying to me, not the politics of the internet, the politics of the web. And I said, no, Ted, the politics of the internet. <laughs> and he was like, no, 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 In the politics of the web. We, we, it was a very interesting conversation. I hope I can have it once again with him. But this is an excellent example. I should have used that example with him saying, your own idea about hyperlinks is, is a political choice. It has, it has design implications and, and implications of, politics. To think about a radical digital project, you just have to look at any radical project in the world, right? And yes, of course, it, it might feel a little different digitally, but we're no longer in a world where we think about online and offline as a binary. None of us do. We recognize that we are digitally embedded just as, you know, digital infrastructure is physically embedded. We're on this continuum of the online to the offline all of us who are digitally connected and those of us who are not, even if um, we don't have agency and control over that. I think of a few principles and practices around this, and I, I'll just offer you a few, some of the things we do that demonstrates this or has a flavor of it and some of the things that other extraordinary people do in the world. At the core of different imagination, I think, and at the core of many of the imaginations of marginalized communities around the world is a very strong sense of collective imagination. So the dance between the individual and the collective. There's a great understanding that we, are, we both have individuality, but we are also relational. It is always relational between us and the collective. When you design that way, then immediately there is a really extraordinary creativity around both what the individual brings and then what the collective works on together. And it becomes reflexive, right? It's the individual to the collective, back to the individual. One of the ways that I think about this, for instance, is any community-led or independent archive, a people's archive, right? Why is it different from a mainstream institutional archive? It's because the textures, the flavors of the way you even think about space is different. Just as an example, there's the Black Cultural Archives in the UK, in London. It took decades for it to be set up, but it's an archives of Afro-descendant folks in the United Kingdom, particularly Afro-Caribbean folks. It is 
one of the few people's archives of its kind. It's one of the few that has physical presence as well as a digital presence. And when you think about how that space is constructed and who uses it and how they use it, it's very differently experienced than the British Museum or the British Library. What is archived is very different from the British Museum or the British Library. It's not just academic publications. It's certainly not treasures from a colonized past. It is often memory of a colonized past and and present. It is told through those who have been through these histories or, or who are descendants of those histories, right? The, the, those who take you through that experience, who narrate that history, are very much those who have the lived experience of it. The way you even participate in understanding these histories and recognizing their multiplicity and their plurality is to recognize at the heart of it both the transgenerational trauma that has been part of Afro-Caribbean history in the United Kingdom and the immense creativity and imagination with which the empire has struck back. That sense of context, that sense of design, that sense of leadership, and that sense of a collective holding of what is what is not a homogenization of history, but a, a holding of multiple strands of a heterogeneous history, right? That that there is a plurality of histories that are being collectively held is a very different um, flavor than most colonial archives. Though, you know, to be fair to archivists of the present, they are trying to break that uh, experience, but it's still very hard. And so if you then take that example of the physical archive that is different when it is led imagined and and uh, curated by those who are part of that living history and then imagine the internet or, or digital projects of the same kind, you get that flavor of um, what it could be like. In whose knowledge's case, just as an example, we write collaboratively, we write collectively. Everything that we write or we speak tends to be a collaborative process. We tend to push the boundaries of academia, for instance, by writing in peer-reviewed journal articles with multivocality, with multiple voices. So it's a collaboratively written piece. We uh, embed audio in it. We sometimes push the visual. And even the visual, the elements of what is visual is based very much on, you know, the different cultures that are, that are uh, and the politics and the backgrounds of those who are writing or speaking. Every element is as intentional as possible, as thoughtful as possible, as respectful as possible, and as honoring of the different imaginations as possible. There's something really interesting about how technology, at least big tech, moves towards a kind of homogen homogenization, a kind of flattening of difference, because it's as though we are terrified of difference. We want everyone to look like us, to feel like us, to be like us. And by us, I mean, you know, whatever version of the man we're thinking about. And yet liberation is really you know, there's a wonderful feminist activist called Charlotte Bunch who says, revolution is a symphony of liberations. And so liberation is really an honoring of multiplicity, of plurality, of difference. And what will it mean to have a digital infrastructure then that is actually multiple digital infrastructures that are imagined and experienced differently with different communities being able to actually control and govern that? In some ways, the early internet was that, right? I mean, the early, early internet with, you know, with all of its flaws and problems. But there was a way in which the early bulletin board systems, the early online spaces, it was already hugely skewed and who could and couldn't access it. But there was a way in which some of those early spaces were, it still had a flavor. Each of them had a different flavor. And now there's, there's this 
part of what has happened with big tech and the way that, you know, Silicon Valley tech capital has taken over uh, our digital experience is that the only difference we are kind of allowed is what some techie sitting in Palo Alto or Menlo Park has decided we can experience, right? There's a great um, boundlessness. There's a great potential possibility as people take back control. There's a fascinating um, example in Aotearoa, uh, New Zealand, of a Maori community who has decided to have its their own speech-to-text translation work and linguistics software. And they control the data set. They control the tech, the actual infrastructure. They, they decide on the use. And they have basically uh, decided, the community of Papa Rio has decided that um, they will certainly not sell their data to proprietary companies, but they will also not open it up to the free and open source movement. Because for them, uh, the free and open source movement is also, with all its good intentions, is also another form of privilege that their community members have never been able to access. And so what does what happens when we when we have more and more of paparios in different parts of the world, right? That's that's my hope. That's that's my imagination. Gotcha. Yeah, that's that's helpful. Hello, my name is Benjamin Mayer Fuchs. I'm the founding director of 17 Institute of Critical Studies. We are based in Mexico City, and this 2021, we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of our institute. To mark the occasion, we are launching a new platform called Critical Switch, which is based on everything we've learned over the past two decades. As an independent institution, one of our most constant efforts has been to maintain our financial autonomy. We have never wanted to depend on public subsidies, private investments, or even grants. But how to achieve this objective? Our participation in the social response to the consequences of the great earthquake of 2017 in Mexico gave us the key. We generated a decentralized platform capable of hosting multiple proposals and initiatives without predefining the economic terms in which they would operate. Rather than working as a crowdfunding platform, Critical Switch encourages the establishment of communities around specific projects. In this way, it gives rise to decentralized collectives devoted to specific purposes. The platform circulates initiatives, the terms of which are defined by their proponents, and those who respond to them can collaborate with them or support them as volunteers, as professionals, or as partners. The advantage being that in this way, we can build relations around ventures that would find it hard to secure support or whose contributions might end up compromising their independence. Here are four of the first proposals we have received. The Assembly of Indigenous Midwives of the State of Chiapas in Mexico aims to allow these caretakers to meet in order to organize a response to their challenges. Although they recognize the contribution that medicine can make to their work, the Mexican health authorities do not, in turn, recognize their own enormous contribution and experience as midwives, which of course goes back hundreds of years. A second project is the book Bodies in Dialogue, Disability, Art and Feminisms, 
a disruptive exchange between feminists, artists, activists, and their contemporary counterparts in the field of disability. This project is relevant to the entire Spanish-speaking world, and it cannot risk entanglement with institutional commitments. We have also received a proposal for a facsimile edition of the book Epidemiae Historia of 1651, the first treatise mentioning the word epidemiology, whose current importance is of course evident. The securing of resources through critical switch will allow this edition a series of conceptual and creative possibilities that would not necessarily be granted by sponsors. Finally, the animated short film The Strange Case of the Bullet Man can locate through Critical Switch animators and artists the world over willing to partner beyond the canons of the industry. This quartet of international initiatives illustrates the scope and flexibility provided by the platform. In a time of diminished possibilities, critical switch multiplies horizons. In addition to giving forth to collectives around each initiative, critical switch will build an encompassing community, bringing together all groups formed by each particular initiative. This great alliance will be housed by a new social network called the Mutual. The Mutual, or La Mutuale, is destined to relate and strengthen the cultural, social and academic sectors on a continental level, in Spanish, in Portuguese and of course also in English. Following the well-known curatorial line of the Institute, Critical Switch and the Mutual will thus provide support for all sorts of critical undertakings, giving executive capacity to reflections and dialogues cultivated within, but also beyond the Institute. Join us! We already await your participation, your proposals and your initiative. It's interesting to think about something like Wikipedia. I do have some sort of sense of like unease or ambivalence precisely because Wikipedia in, in many ways has accomplished something that like no other project in the history of the internet has managed to accomplish, which is to kind of be a genuine public good, not really controlled by, by capital. It doesn't have this texture of, of, of plurality that you're that you're uh, that you're discussing. Another parallel in my mind is if you think about the early internet, where you had these different sort of communities. There's a kind of a. It's not perfect, but there's a kind of an obvious rough parallel between that and like the sort sort of you know decentralized Web three thing. Now, where there's lots of different communities, which are all quite quite different, or whatever. Most of the Web3 communities that exist are dominated by privileged people, right? And I really suspect that that's also true of the early internet communities. You know, I mean, I think, may, may, I mean, maybe, <laughs> I'm not sure what, you may, correct me if I'm wrong, but perhaps it's like rose-colored memory to think that those weren't <laughs> like that way. Oh, no, in they the totally yeah. were. I okay. was just, the, the only facet of those communities that I was sort of pointing to was that they were still elements of self-governance and self-design, right. Right. that we've, we've lost that as well, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, but you do see that in, 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 uh, in like blockchain communities now. You do see this element of self-governance and self-design, right? Uh, and uh, who's, again, right? Who's, but yeah, but, it's this, yeah. but you yeah. see what I mean? There's a, there's a parallel. It's the same problem, actually, again. It's just the same That is true. Um, shape. 
That is true. I will say that some of the early uh, communities online included some of us who were privileged enough from the global south to be on it, right? Uh, our first years of university or whatever, we we could get online and be on it. But there's always been privilege. So I, I totally agree with you. I, I don't think we're disagreeing at all. And you are right. There's an illusion, if you like, of, of, of self-governance as well that's part of it. But Wikipedia is a good example of what you and I are both talking about, which is that there's an outright critique of what big tech is doing. Then there's a critique to be had of even the spaces that we think of as better than big tech. And the reason for that is because if we if we feel righteous about the spaces that we have constructed that are in resistance to big tech um, and honor them without some tough love, then we are not being transformative at all, right? And so often, because I am a Wikipedian, I will talk to my community, I will talk to Wikipedians and Wikimedians and say, this is my offering of tough love. Because I love this community. I love being part of it. This is critical infrastructure. And we need to do so much more. Right. Um, and I think there's an element of that, Matt, to sort of bring it a little bit full circle to that sort of Fred Turner reminder of the original internet culture, which is that there's a certain righteousness, you know, self-righteousness. There's a kind of self-congratulatory mode. Yeah, look at what we've done. How cool is this, right? Of seeing in the internet as sort of a, a disruption of history, of seeing it as exceptional, when, to be honest, everything we say about the internet has been said about other infrastructures in the past, right? It is true that it has changed the speed and the range through which we communicate, but there is a similarity to other infrastructures, particularly communications infrastructures in the past. And there's a similarity to the dynamics of power. So Wikipedia is, in my tough love, one of the things uh, that we, and not just I, but all of us who are sort of trying to remind the Wikipedians who have created this infrastructure over the last 20 years, is that if it is truly to be the sum of all human knowledge, which is, you know, a powerful mission, who is human on Wikipedia? Who is missed out? And who gets to tell that story? Who gets to write that content? And not just that, but what are the ways in which we can go beyond the notion of knowledge gaps, which is where Wikipedians are right now. So there's a gap in content, there's a gap in contributors, but how do we go beyond that to say there's a gap in justice, there's a gap in who gets to participate in this incredible volunteer community with the same kind of powers and uh, credibility that, you know, the stewards and the admins of the Wikimedia movement do. I've asked this kind of anecdotal question to, to friends over the years who are within the movement, but I've asked an American white man, for instance, how much of his childhood can he find on Wikipedia, right? Instances of the books he read, the events that he went through, the inspirations of his life. I've asked that question of myself. I've asked that question of uh, black and brown and trans women and men from the global south. And a cis white man from the States is likely to tell me about 90% of my childhood is, is represented by Wikipedia. I will find something and it, and it will be okay. And in many of our cases, less than 50%. The kinds of ways in which Wikipedia is even constructed and written Right. And by that, and this is where I move beyond content and contributors to one of the great pillars of Wikipedia guidelines and, and policy is the notion of neutrality. Right. That all content on Wikipedia must be neutral. It's a guideline that is used with good intention, of course, as all these things are. The idea is let's not have people you know, inflecting it with, you know, 
crazy political views that are uh, problematic. We should be unbiased. We should be balanced. But as we know, and as social scientists tell us increasingly, there's no such thing as neutrality. There's absolutely no such thing as neutrality. Fact is still embedded in power. Whose facts do we know more of, right? Do we know uh, Jagdish Chandra Bose as well as we know Marconi in terms of the development of the history of the radio? We do not. I know Jagdish Chandra Bose because he's Indian. If I asked that question to anybody who listens to the radio, they would all have heard of Marconi. They would not have heard of Bose, right? What does that mean? So facts are embedded in power. When we talk about neutrality, what it can do, which it often does on Wikipedia, is it pushes against every form of knowledge that doesn't have the evidence that is understood through the Western knowledge system. Wikipedia, even as it sees itself as a community project and a crowdsourced project, Many of my communities will never use the word crowdsource because the word crowd itself for us, as you can imagine, often has elements of violence. We'll say community sourced, but it's based still in uh, elements of the Western academic system and in notions of the Western encyclopedia, right? So it has to be based on reliable sources. And most Wikipedians want those reliable sources to be peer published reliable sources, books, peer-published journal articles. Now, again, that's not a bad thing by itself. But what Wikipedians have to understand is who do you leave out when you have that at the core of it, right? What if we were to move from the notion of neutrality to the notion of evidence? Because evidence is important, right? So what is an evidence-based knowledge system? or repository of knowledge. What happens when we move the notion of evidence from just reliable published material, which are most often in Eurolingual languages? I mean, Google did a projection when they were first doing Google Books and they found that there are, I don't know, approximately 130 million books ever published, most of them in European languages. There are over 7,000 languages. Languages, language is a proxy of knowledge. And yet most of us in the world have not had our knowledges published in the same way as European or North American knowledge. So what happens when the sources of evidence are also shifted to be different? What happens when we have oral citations? What happens when we have visual citations? What happens when we have... Um, citations of sound that are not just spoken, right? I mean, how, how can we push the notion of what evidence is to recognize the many different forms of evidence in the many different forms of knowledge systems that exist in the world today? And that's the kind of journey we want Wikipedians to be on with us. You know, a problem with Wikipedia is that it basically it prohibits contestation. It says that it is not a place of contestation, right? It's a place where just neutral knowledge is is cataloged and for that reason because it disallows contestation it reifies a certain kind of of, of knowledge actually it's a little different than that because it, it loves contestation in some ways um you know when i first started editing wikipedia even before i started editing wikipedia i used to my my anthropologist uh heart was overjoyed by the talk pages because, you know, the talk pages are where people discuss the substance of the article itself. Everything on the talk page is a contestation of what is on in the article. But the, but the contestation there is based on an ability to understand and be comfortable with argumentation, to prove your point, to prove your position, to back it up with evidence, right? with reliable sources and citations. So it's not so much contestation in that sense. What it is, is that Wikipedia's notion of neutrality is that there should be no expressed political opinion in an article, right? So this is not opinion, this is fact. And you are essentially uh, offering fact 
by backing up your statement with reliable sources and citations, right? To, to establish the fact. What that does is that without recognizing that fact is embedded still in power, without recognizing that reliable sources are still embedded in power, what you will end up with is what happened to me when I first edited Wikipedia with a full length article, right? I, I Not even full length. I started what is called a stub, a paragraph. And it was on African feminist, uh, who, who's a well-known philanthropist. I by then, I'd been sort of copy editing Wikipedia for over two years. I sat and wrote a paragraph of four or five lines with about 11 references. And I chose the person, B.C. Adelaide Fayemi, because I knew that there would be good citations around her. Very well known in Nigeria. She's known across Africa. The organization she set up is very, very well known. So I wasn't even going to the, you know, the outliers. I was pretty much, I, I felt quite in the middle. I did this and within five minutes, I had what is called a speedy deletion notice, which basically is, this is rubbish. Take it off if you can't prove why it should be here. The only reason that I, as a newbie Wikipedian, didn't walk away from Wikipedia for the rest of my life is because I was at that time sitting in the first ever Wiki in Daba, which is the gathering of African Wikimedians. And I was sitting next to someone who had been the ch one of the chairs of the Wikimedia Foundation boards, a long-term Wikipedian, and I could kind of nudge her and say to her, and I had been editing during my lunchtime, and I could nudge her and say, Florence, what do I do about this? And Florence looks at it and goes, this is ridiculous. And basically like sort of, Marches off to the talk page and says, this is ridiculous. This does not make any sense. You have not substantiated why it should have a speedy deletion notice, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And I could then substantiate back. And part of it was recognizing that whoever this Wikipedian was who had strolled by on a fine, you know, afternoon in, in Johannesburg was probably sitting somewhere in the States, had never heard of someone like B.C. Adelaide Fayemi. The name itself was, what the hell is that name? Um, Nigerian newspapers are considered to be deeply controversial. They're not sort of good publications, uh, you know, with good journalistic values. They probably assume that, you know, Der Spiegel and New York Times is everybody's local newspaper. Nigeria is one of the largest countries in the world, right? It's literally one of the largest countries in the world. So for us not to recognize how skewed publishing is, academia is, all the different sources of, um, you know, mainstream knowledge as we know it, public knowledge is, and therefore its impact on Wikipedia means that essentially Wikipedians are still struggling to, to accept that the humanity of some of our, us is not yet the humanity of everyone. And not just the humanity of some of us, but really literally the humanity of most of us in the world. When you think about remedying this, do you locate the problem with the institution of Wikipedia or with the culture of the people on it? I assume both and might be the answer, but are you more interested in changing the hearts and minds of the people who occupy these spaces or in changing the institutional setups or creating, you know, more plurality? Just as an example, we recently... Um, co-convened with Wikimedia Deutschland, which is the institution or the, the, the sort of Wikimedia chapter that holds Wikidata, which is the largest free and open source structured data repository uh, online today, and Wikimovemento Brazil, which is the Brazilian-based Wikimedian group. Um, we co-convened a conversation on decolonizing structured data. Right. Because most people, lay people don't understand how structured data uh, sort of influences us. But of course, structured data is machine readable data that sort of governs the way that we now interact with most apps, most platforms in the world. It tells us what to look at and how to look at it. And what we were trying to get um, both the Wikidata team, the technologists 
of Wikidata, who've been working on Wikidata for nine years, as well as the contributors of Wikidata, who are the, you know, the volunteers around the world, to recognize is that Wikidata and the notions of structured data are still very much centered in one particular understanding of categorizations, of classifications, right? It is a very particular Western 18th century onwards, enlightenment driven version of the world that is the categories of Wikidata. And when you categorize that way, a whole host of the ways that we live and the ways that we know each other are completely lost. One of the examples I was pointing out, the uh, Australian indigenous, indigenous notion of Jukurpa, um, which Western anthropologists have called dreaming or dream time, then have proceeded to call it Aboriginal art. Jukurpa is not art. It is a visual representation of philosophy, of mythology, of ways of understanding the past, present, and future, literally ways of being. But if you don't understand that, and if that is not even something that your taxonomy, your ontology can comprehend, then what we will end up continuing to do is to continue to reify and exacerbate the notion of dream time as abor aboriginal art. In doing that work, we have to work both with the individual contributors to, to sort of help expand their consciousness around this work that they're doing. And we have to work with the institutions like Wikimedia Deutschland and the Wikimedia Foundation uh, and the technologists and other staff who are there. Um, because transformation is always going to be a dance between the individual and the institution. And it's always going to be both transformation from within these institutions and from without it. It's always going to be that. And I say this as someone who was part of those institutions, right? I, 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 I was on the executive team of the Wikimedia Foundation for three years. So I recognize that these are difficult conversations to have, but because they are difficult, we cannot get away from the urgency and the necessity to have them. And that's really the way in which we work. We, we, we do both, uh, right? We, we play that, that sort of dance as far as we can. We ally with as many friends and co-conspirators as possible. We see this work as solidarity in action because none of this can be done with any single individual or any single organization. This is work we all have to do together. There are so many, like, just incredibly deep questions about universality on the surface of it, just ostensibly. Many of the things that have happened in the past, you know, in modernity have had to do with translation of sort of making every making things comprehensible across cultural lines and things like that. But it seems like the those processes of translating things across cultural lines, it can create a flattening because the the terms in which we translate our cultures or our ways of thinking in order to be understood by the whole world, we can reify those. We can we we can confuse the uh, the map with the territory, right? So, in other words, by creating a creating a map of whatever territory we're we're mapping, we can lose the difference between the map and the territory. That's beautifully put. That really is, and translation is a really interesting choice of word and it's a powerful choice of word and I'm going to use it very literally and then go metaphoric with it. One of the things we're engaged in doing and hopefully this will be out in February, we're hoping to launch in February, is what we're calling the State of the Internet's Languages Report. So we're looking at the multilinguality of the internet and, and trying to see how multilingual it is and it's really, I'm, I'm, I'm not sort of giving away the plot by saying it is woefully not multilingual. Um, and in fact, um, most of us in the world have to use our nearest colonial language, as we say, 
to access the internet and to access content. Now, one of the really interesting things is as we were doing the research around this, is that we realized that the most translated book in the world, mm-hmm. one, one shot at it, Matt. The Bible. The Bible in over 2,000 languages. The most translated document in the world? The Bible. Well, no, document as opposed to, to book, but the most uh, translated document in the world is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in over 500 languages. Now, both of these fascinatingly, have a very interesting form of universality yeah. embedded in them. Oh, uh, yeah. Different, yeah, yeah. But, but related and similar, you know. Yeah. Well, I, I was just going to say, I mean, there's, there's a rabbit hole we don't have time to go down, but the, but the Bible was not, necess- you know, the Old Testament was not necessarily conceived as a universal document when it was first created. Correct. And the way, again, it's used becomes universalizing, right? It's why it's one of the reasons I prefer the Old Testament to the New. But anyway, uh, also a rabbit hole. It's a great telenovela is, is the Old Testament. There's a way in which, you know, for most of us from the global South, the church, the state, and the corporation from the 1600s onwards have been in an unholy, pun intended, nexus to govern our bodies, our minds, our resources, our imaginations, and to completely dehumanize us, right? That's what the project of colonialism has been and continues to be included in in digital spaces now. But the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a really interesting example as well, because even as we think about human rights being important for all of us, there are elements in which that universality is also not necessarily contextually understood, right? And so I reject in some ways, or I critique, let me put it this way, because I do use the human rights framework when it's appropriate. I critique the universality. I also critique the notion of cultural relativism, because in both of these notions, there is a way in which they're co-opted and used to actually oppress communities in different ways, right? cultural relativism internally even more, and universality sort of more externally. When we are embedded in pluralism, however, we are in a sense doing exactly what you say, which is we are doing our best to celebrate difference without flattening it, but also not to use difference as a form of oppression. Right. And I think that for me, it all centers around power, right? How yeah. do we use power? How do we abuse power? What is the actual lived experience and practice of what happens to us? It doesn't matter what words we use, what words we don't use, but how in our relationships with each other are we ultimately living our values? And how do they, how do they then sit in our bodies and in our minds and in our imaginations. So, so there's a really interesting way in which that universality and universalism that is at the heart of tech becomes an issue because Silicon Valley then assumes that the global is literally the hyperlocal of Silicon Valley. The notion of globality is used and abused, but they don't actually understand what it means to be global in any meaningful way. If there's an attack on a user of uh, Facebook in Menlo Park, that's more likely to be taken up immediately and looked at rather than, you know, three years of Burmese refugees and the Rohingya who literally went through genocide because Facebook could not invest in a Burmese language translation team for over three years. It's insane. It's insane. It's insane. The, yeah. It's insane. I mean, for so long, actually, you, you know, as you just said, universality has been like an ideal. The more we can universalize knowledge, the better. It's really interesting to think about. You can trace that all the way back to New Testament. I think at the core of this is that power is contextual. We always have to remember context. We always have to recognize that those of us who are oppressed today in one context could be oppressors 
tomorrow or in the next hour in another context. We always have to have that discomfort of recognizing the dynamics of power like a second skin, right? I have to be harder on myself than anybody else in thinking about power and how I walk through the world. It all comes down to the practice of it. And I think it's really, really important that as we look at the digital world and at digital infrastructures, we recognize that those who create the problems do not have the imagination to solve those problems. So they can and must support us as we do it, because sadly, they are also the ones with the resources. But the imaginations of those of us who have been at the front lines of the oppressions of digital infrastructure need to be at the core of the design of whatever multiple sets of futures that are going to come. And safety, to be honest, is a really low bar. I don't just want an internet that are safe for me, though I think that's a necessary but insufficient condition. I want internets, I want a digital set of infrastructures where I can be joyful, where I can be the fullness of myself and where all my communities can be the fullness of their multiple selves. That's the set of internets that I want. Really, really grateful the conversation. Yeah, I, clearly you and I need to have like, you know, long conversations to be able to go down those rabbit holes, Matt. I'm looking forward to the rabbit hole conversations at some point. Yeah. Inshallah, yes. <laughs> Inshallah. I'm Audrey Tong, Taiwan's Digital Minister. Really happy to share with friends around the world about our digital democracy. Now, it's rare to hear those two words mixing together because democracy is an ancient concept that goes back to the ancient Athens, but digital is much more recent. But in Taiwan, the internet and democracy began literally at the same year. To me, democracy means working with the people, not just for the people. And digital democracy is a way for us to transcend the time and space boundaries so people around the globe in different time zones can also make decisions together. In Taiwan, we countered the pandemic with no lockdown and countered the infodemic with no takedowns. If the technologies are controlled in the hands of a few, then people feel less and less empowered when it concerns issues of common interest, for example, rationing out masks, uh, tracing the contacts of infected people, or distributing vaccines in a fair way. We need open innovations from around all the corners of our society and the world in order to make it fast, fair, and fun. So a democracy that's fast, fair, and fun need to scale using the help of digital technologies. In Taiwan, our first presidential election was in 1996. And that was also the year that the Wild Web became really popular in Taiwan. So internet and democracy in Taiwan are not two things, but rather one and the same thing, just like bubble and tea, that could be mixed together in any which way. Because in many ancient republics and democracies, people think of democracy as something that's fixed, like uploading three bits of information every person every four years called voting. But because in Taiwan, democratization takes place on the internet, so we have higher bandwidth of democracy, of participatory budgeting, of sandbox applications, presidential hackathon, citizens' initiatives, so on and so forth. I believe that Bubble Tea represents the spirit of open innovation. It could be white tapioca bomb, 
black tapioca ball. It could be red tea, it could be any kind of tea, really. Uh, but as long as they're mixed together, it gives rise to creativity and enjoyment around the world. And people can adapt this open innovation without fear of being sued uh, by patents or copyright or trademark losses. And that means that uh, uh, innovation is very easy to make from the front line to uh, empower people closest to the pain or to the thirst, as it were. Uh, and people can make their own recipes and freely share it around the world. And that's the spirit of Taiwanese digital democracy. When I was a child, Taiwan was still under the martial law. And indeed, we relied on international correspondence in, for example, Hong Kong, to report the human rights violations during Taiwan's martial law era, and also to strategize on how to change Taiwan for the better. Now, fast forward to today, of course, we've been ranked as the most open and democratic society in our corner of the world. So it's our turn to provide this international stage for people, per perhaps in Hong Kong, perhaps now moved to Taiwan, to voice their concerns about the backsliding of democracy in their regions, about the worry that authoritarianism may take over, and strategize with people around the world to make sure that the democratic polities work together to advance, not just defend, democracy. As I said in the Oslo Freedom Forum, ring the bells that still can ring. Forget our perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. And that's how the light gets in. It hardly needs to be said that democracy is under attack all over the world. Our outdated institutions are stuck in a bureaucratic quagmire where they profit by fomenting division, rendering them unable to address the greatest issues that we are facing as a species. But as we've seen, innovative leaders and groups working both inside and outside their respective states from Audrey Tang and the GovZero movement in Taiwan, Japan, and Korea, to Chris Hansen and the cooperative movement in Colorado are solving these problems in exciting new ways by using civic technology to allow citizen coders to take matters into their own hands, breathing new life into our stale, gridlocked institutions. And yet, amidst this innovation, the large corporations that mediate our online lives are using our data in increasingly frivolous and dangerous ways, forcing on us a kind of data colonialism, where their users, especially minorities and those in the global south, are exploited and manipulated without any say as to how their data is used and without any share of the profits. But again, there are brilliant leaders and organizations made up of people from around the world working to address these issues by redefining the concept of personhood and incorporating radical social technologies like quadratic voting, data dignity, and create disintermediated platforms which they own and govern themselves. And at the center of all this is the art which as we've learned from thinkers like Ted Chang, Zizi Papakarisi, Fred Turner, and Charlotte Kent, is unparalleled in expressing and educating people on democratic ideas and ideals. These tools and platforms, such as Ampled, Culture Steak, and more, give artists the ability to own their work and allow communities to form and govern themselves using art as the bedrock on which to build a shared culture. We thank you for watching, and we hope that you'll join us 
and the people we've highlighted at this conference, as we believe that a radically egalitarian and participatory future is within reach. This is Radical Exchange, and this is a new era of democracy. Thank you.